I call the April 10th, 2024 Planning Board meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, we have a quorum, so we don't need to appoint any alternates. I will start with uh, administrative board work. Uh, I will accept a motion. Um, to approve the minutes of March 6, 2024. Uh, Mr. Chair? Sure. I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Board approve the minutes from our March 6, 2024 meeting. Second. Second. Fantastic. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, I believe Sean would abstain. He wasn't there, so uh, just note that Sean would abstain. And I will accept a motion to approve the minutes of March 13th, 2024. Uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Board approve the uh, minutes of our uh, Planning Board meeting from March 13th, 2024. Second. Second, Second by Art. And uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? We would note that Sean would abstain. I'm not quite used to this, so a little slow. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Um, we also have two extension requests. The first one is for uh, the Patori uh, site plan. Um, map 13, lot 99 is looking to extend to June 12th. I'll take a motion for that. So move, Mr. Chair. Second. Second by Art. All, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? None. Uh, and our second one is for the Woodmont Commons Medical Office Building. They are looking for an extension to, where are we here? July 1st. July 1st, 2024. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Fantastic. Um, any discussions with town staff? Mr. Chair, just to note, um, the PUD before you this evening, staff did determine it is of regional impact and we have begun that process. I just need to formally make the board aware of that. Sure. Jay. Yes. Um, those two things you went over are not what was on the... Yes, they are. No, no, no. Those are those are continuances. These are extensions gotcha. for okay. already approved right. site plans. Right. Right. Yes. I was getting a little confused there. So. Not a problem. Nothing. John, Nothing anything? Nothing. Fantastic. Um, old business. The first one is a uh, public hearing on an application for formal review of a site plan to construct a 58,432 square foot warehouse and storage facility and associated site improvements, 88A Harvey Road, Plainview Drive, Map 14, Lot 17, Zoned Industrial 2, Patriot Holdings LLC applicant and VAB Properties LLC owner. Uh, this has been continued from January 10th and February 14th. They are looking for a continuance to May 8th. I'll accept a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> All second. Fantastic. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Wonderful. You have to give the official announcement uh, yes. of the continuance. <laughs> yes. So this, um, this has been continued to the public hearing on an application for formal review of a site plan to construct a 58,432 square foot warehouse and storage facility and associated site improvements, 88A Harvey Road, Plainview Drive, Map 14, Lot 17, Zone Industrial 2, Patriot Holdings LLC applicant, and VAB Properties LLC owner has been continued to May 8th, 2024. At 7 p.m. right here. At 7 p.m. <laughs> all day. Only, this is your only notice. This is your <laughs> only notice. <laughs> That's in the statutes. <laughs> this is amazing teamwork. Don't you love it? <laughs> That's what makes things go. We're learning. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have a, uh, a public hearing on an application for formal review of a site plan for a 96-unit multifamily residential development and associated site improvements in the multifamily residential district. 35 Gilcrest Road, tax map 7, lot 118. Gilcrest Realty Holdings LLC is the owner and applicant. This was continued from March 6, 2024, <clears throat> and they are looking for a continuance to May 1st, 2024. I will accept a motion. So move, Mr. Chair. All second. Second by Art. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, this has been approved, and the public hearing on an application for a formal review of a site plan 
for a 96 unit multifamily residential development and associated site improvements in the multifamily residential district 35 Gilcrest Road tax 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 map 7 lot 118 Gilcrest Realty Holdings LLC has been continued to May 1st 2024 and this is your first and only notice on it public announcement public announcement on it <laughs> all right I've done it for too long <laughs> <laughs> So we've got some new plans. Uh, the first one is a public hearing on an application for a conditional use permit for 132,612 square feet of temporary wetland impacts and 10,472 square feet of permanent wetland impacts, 18,327 square feet of temporary wetland buffer impacts and 11,422 square feet of permanent wetland buffer impacts for the replacement and maintenance of existing overhead transmission line structures located within the conservation overlay district in the existing T158 transmission line right away in the area of Page Road, zoned AR1, Public Service Company of New Hampshire, DBA, Eversource Energy. All right, let me pull that up and uh, come on up. Well, thank you everybody for having us. My name is Kurt Nelson from Eversource Energy. I'm a manager of licensing and permitting. I'm joined by John Rolino, who is our environmental engineer from AECOM. I'm also joined by Stephanie, Stephanie Gardner from our project services outreach group. Stephanie's right there, who can uh, be our point person if there's any abutters to the project tonight that have any specific questions, not uh, related specifically to this application, uh, Stephanie can help you out. Um, so to high level summary, uh, just one quick correction. This is the I-158, uh, 115 KV transmission line circuit that runs northwest out of the Scobie Pond substation up to the Hughes Road substation in Manchester. Uh, this is the last of our laminate wood uh, 115 KV structures that uh, is being changed out in its entirety due to the defective nature uh, of those structures. This I have fun you hold up for one second. Sure. Just yep. before we keep going, I did forget to do completeness. Um, Art, right, if you want to make a motion. I'll on make it. a motion, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that uh, we accept the application as complete for our staff's recommendation dated April 10th, 2024. I'll second that, Mr. Chair. A second by Lynn. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That's easy to mess up. Seeing none, uh, so, the so, motion is passed. So it starts the hearing, it also starts the 65 day time clock. This starts the official public hearing as well as the 65 day time clock. All right, gentlemen, All sorry right. about that. No worries, thank you. Uh, so again, this is our uh, I-158, 115 KV uh, transmission line. Uh, the work, scope of work is very similar to uh, the various change outs that you have seen over the last few years. We had the change out of the four circuits all at once a couple of years ago that were heading uh, southbound, I believe, out of, out of Scobie. This one's heading northwest. Uh, again, this will be the last of our uh, line, full line uh, change outs for these laminate wood structures. Uh, same construction methods. Uh, one, cat, one difference, however, uh, is uh, for this particular project, uh, based on the permitting requirements that the DES Wetland Bureau uh, has been uh, wanting of us recently over the past year. Uh, typically, we would do this work under a statutory permit by notification process for utility maintenance. The DES has expressed concerns with us that construction matting uh, may be leading to permanent impacts to wetlands. Uh, we strongly disagree with that assertion, but we are following their lead in terms of their permitting requirements. So this is being permitted under a standard dredge and fill uh, application. And um, we have, as you can see and on, this, on this map set here, you can see that we're, uh, this line starts out behind our Scobie Pond uh, complex. There are many, uh, many lines to maintain in that area. And it is also a nice thing to have unfettered access around the substation complex itself. So we are proposing in a few areas that we've assessed uh, to put in permanent gravel access across some of these wetlands. Uh, the nature of these wetlands are ones that have been crossed many times before. 
uh, by construction matting or have suffered some previous degradation from repeated vehicle passage. So in our opinion, it made sense considering the DES was taking a mindset that some of these impacts may, might not be temporary, that they might in fact be permanent. Well, we, we might as well then for the sake of the rate payer, uh, give ourselves good unfettered access that uh, won't require us to uh, do continuous permitting just across some small wetlands complexes. So we can uh, provide an example. I think in this package there was a, a photo of a, of, of a typical uh, wetland. Right. So, uh, right. So you can see there's there's an example of two of the types of crossings. The one on top is a is I, our first crossing. Again, that that access route has established gravel in the uplands. It can it takes us throughout our right of way corridor. It's just intermittently um, transected by some wetland complexes here or there. Uh, so we are proposing uh, permanent gravel. We're calling them rock fords in those areas so that we won't have to incur the cost of repeated matting and, uh, and, and permitting processes if we're uh, simply looking to acquire access into that portion of the right-of-way. The these stone fords, um, I believe we have a um, uh, cross-section or just a, a, a detail of those in the package. Um, basically what we're doing is we're digging down about a foot uh, and then we are going to backfill with a uh, sort of either trap rock or gravel mix uh, to grade, to pre-existing grade. Uh, the hope is that there's some interstitial flow uh, through these so that we're maintaining the hydrology of the wetland on either side to the extent possible. Um, and keeping, and, and then also allowing, not making any changes in surface flows uh, as a result. So that's kind of a newer practice for us, but we thought it was absolutely appropriate uh, in this particular right of way. The, um, again, as far as the construction methods, we'll be uh, installing new steel structures. The, um, just for, for reference, the existing poles out there currently range between 45 and 80 feet. Uh, the new poles will be between 50 and 105 feet. The average height currently is 63 feet. The new height will be 71 feet. The tall 100-foot structures will be on either side of Route 10, uh, excuse me, just north of Exit 5 on I-93. Um, we currently there is a structure in the median in the highway. There we will be removing that structure in the median, but we, we will need taller structures on either side of the highway. Uh, in order to make that span. Um, again, uh, we'll be using timber matting in wetlands. We construct, if a structure is located in a wetland that's 100 by 100 approximately, uh, timber mat pad used to uh, uh, facilitate that new structure installation and wire changeover. Uh, in upland areas, we will construct a uh, gravel access pad, a flat work area, again, approximately 100 by 100. Um, during the restoration phase of the project, the gravel work pad gets reduced down to approximately 30 by 60 uh, during that restoration process. Um, you can see there's been a lot of fresh earthwork in the right-of-way corridor in London area over the last few years, so uh, we understand that those gravel areas can be pretty stark. Um, but we would, uh, based on personal experience in, in these particular right-of-ways, that over time these gravel pads will in fact vegetate themselves as well and, and not look as stark as they, they do uh, coming right off of construction. Um, I think we, you had mentioned the impact totals. I think I had slightly different, um, I think the first three. So we, we have 132,612 temporary wetlands impact, uh, 10,472 permanent wetlands impact. Uh, let me see. I have a permanent buffer impact at 18,327. No, that's temporary. That's temporary? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Temporary buffer impact at 18,327. And then permanent buffer impact at 114,222. 
Did I get that correct, John? Yeah, that's what I okay. So we just want to get that on the what record. Was, what was the final number? 114. 114,222. We have it incorrect in our staff memo. Yep. So we're it's incorrect on their application. Let me see here. Uh, yep. <laughs> well, maybe we can maybe we can rectify. We're, we're reading 114,222. So you wanted to amend it? Yeah. Make an amendment. Yes. I'm fine with doing that, but yeah. just make it accurate. Just clarify that for yep. the yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Can so we provide it, can we provide you a copy? Was it in the nat the narrative? I, maybe I have it up uh, on screen now that application. But if you're clarifying what 114. Two, two, two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we've got a copy here. That's, yeah. We want, want you just for the record if you want to just show that. Yeah. <clears throat> so we apologize for any discrepancy if that was. That's all right. I just wanted to be accurate. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> <what I'm saying. laughs> uh, just a tenfold. Uh, so just so. to confirm, uh, it is not 11,422 square feet of mm -hmm. permanent buffer impact. It's 114,222 square feet of permanent buffer impact. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> a large part of that impact is uh, associated with gravel, the gravel access roads and uplands, which we uh, like to maintain for future access and also for <clears throat> those gravel work pad areas. And John, am I safe to assume we may have overestimated the permanent? As I said, I think these are all based on our full build out. We will reduce the, the size of these pads during restoration to, to some degree. We're happy to keep the larger number on, on record. Right. Certainly, yeah, we, we, you'll see many of the pads when possible we pick at the maximum size, but if it is possible to, to shrink them in the field, they certainly will, and, and certainly as part of the construction process, they actually kind of get peeled back over time uh, when as, as less larger vehicles are out there uh, constructing things. Sure. We had uh, we were in front of the Conservation Commission last night, and there were two requests made. Uh, one was um, for us to provide a plan showing where we might propose putting in gates. Uh, we understand with the uh, access and transmission right of ways by uh, uh, illegal ATV use on transmission right of ways is a problem everywhere, not just in places where you may be improving gravel access, so um, that is a deliverable uh, which we will provide the town. We don't have it at this point. Um, that would be caveat. I think there is a, a good location uh, at the Scobie Pond complex for another gate. It's uh, difficult for vehicles to get in uh, through the main gate, but uh, I think we can probably benefit by another gate uh, on, at that complex. And then as we move through the right-of-way corridor, um, we will identify areas that might make sense, and we'll just want to reach out to the underlying property owners and get their permission uh, in fact, that they are, in fact, in favor of those gates. Sure. You said there was two. There was gates, and what else? Uh, number two was a request uh, by one of the uh, a, a suggestion, and I don't know if that made it as a, as a formal uh, request by the conservation to the planning board or not, but we understand, the, you know, all of our projects um, by the nature of the work, we are we are impacting your buffer. We understand that. Uh, we're doing that in the name of, of maintenance of the transmission system. Uh, but he had made a I had made mention to the fact that we are paying into the the state's arm fund for our permanent impacts. Uh, he uh, threw out the um, suggestion of paying into the town's conservation fund as a, as a sort of a mitigation for our disturbance in the right-of-way corridor and um, on the face of it not you know Eversource um, has a great working relationship with the town and we really do appreciate it. we understand how much work we do for the town uh, but my I guess my request was to get guidance from the town in terms of whether there's a what the mechanism of determining <coughs> what that fee might be or if this is or whether it's sort of an ad hoc or a, how, how that would work it, it was a suggestion thrown out that it might be similar to the maybe the calculators that are used in the state's uh, arm fund. Um, I think if we that's typically uh, for wetlands. 
if we were talking about extending that to buffer areas, again, we're at 114,000. That could be quite, quite, a, quite a cost on the ratepayers' dime if we were to follow Connor that. Kelly, that is that guidance. something we've done before? No. We have not done that historically. No, with these specific requests, I, the way and our our conservation commission chair is here this evening. However, the way I interpreted the uh, meeting that I watched this morning and the comment I received through our design review process, um, that seemed to be more of a suggestion and the beginning yeah. of a potential conversation about. Yeah, something I, like I that agree. Going it would forward. certainly be something we wouldn't act on tonight. Correct. But maybe trying to find. I wouldn't a, advise find a acting on that the this evening. Yeah. The other recommendation, however, with respect to the gates, we've seen that yep. um, request in the past from the commission. Yep. And I just want to note as well that the commission did recommend approval of the CUP for this evening. Yep. Fantastic. You guys have anything else? <clears throat> um, it, yeah, if the, if, the, if the board is comfortable uh, and would like, would like to condition that we provide a plan showing gate locations, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through, we'll, we'll, we'll talk with staff, come through the board, go to the public, and then we'll, we'll talk a bit mm -hmm. about the, uh, the condition itself. Um, so with the public hearing, I'll, I'll start over here at our staff. If you guys have any additional comments? I have nothing. I'll send it to you. Okay, I'll bring it over to the board. Um, I'll start with Ann. I don't have any questions, but I hear you're um, good to deal with as far as um, the wetlands and um, anything you disturb, you fix it before you leave. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. D? I have nothing, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Just uh, one question. What, what's the life expectancy of the new poles? Uh, I, the, the, I'm going to, the number I most frequently hear is about 70 years. They're, they're weathered steel. And the poles obviously have, uh, it's a urethane coating, I'm told, on it. This is really the thick black, black yeah. you know, um, water resistant coating at the base. On the bottom right, portion. Right, correct. Of it. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Rudd? Uh, the old poles uh, are going to be removed in, uh, in the site? Correct, yes. Yeah. So the, uh, we, the, we get yep. varying guidance from the DES sometimes in wetlands have given us guidance at times to just cut at the base versus versus removing the in their entirety we can do either and I don't know if we've gotten a condition to with that respect on this particular project if there's a preference on behalf of the I, I in my opinion I, why not just take them right out yeah there, there may be constructability reasons in some cases why it might be easier to, to to leave the base you know cut it flush with the yeah I don't know yeah it could it be different bases that uh, would hold a pole, a pole in so uh, you know right the, the new poles will be offset usually it's typically about 10 feet 10 to 15 feet or so from the original and, and we can always <coughs> make uh, conditions once we have a discussion yeah. on uh, conditions of approval absolutely yeah I'm all set mr. chair Jason I'm all set mr. chair Roger certainly I'm all set I've watched your work it's good thank you yeah. much appreciated Fantastic, and I will. Uh, oh, I'll open it up to the public. I don't know if anybody has anything they'd like to say. Uh, Ray Person, Three Gary Drive. Uh, I understand all of this is important. Uh, we're talking about uh, bringing uh, vital electricity into the town, but I would like to say this: uh, this is having a lot of impact on the town of Londonderry uh, in, in many ways. Um, and this is uh, a distribution center, probably the largest distribution center in the state of New Hampshire, coming through uh, Londonderry, uh, which affects a lot of things. It affects our vistas, it affects wetland, uh, and it takes up a lot of property. And um, I think the suggestion that was made uh, should be considered uh, in addition to the arms fund uh, which they are providing. Um, I, I think it would be reasonable to provide some other mitigation to the town. Uh, we have a lot of impact uh, and there's going to be more. Uh, I believe the towers are going to be even higher uh, in some areas. Um, this 
there's a lot of impact on the town. And uh, I think even though this is a vital service they were providing, um, I think we need to consider and look at that. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Okay, uh, Ray, I got a question. Uh, you talked about uh, mitigation. What do you recommend for mitigation? Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure it's up to me to um, <clears throat> is even for an opinion. <laughs> well, um, what is mitigation? I mean, it, 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 it could be money, uh, but it could be other things. Um, for instance, if it's um, having an impact on wetland, um, then uh, just like when the highway came through, uh, there was other land set aside uh, to make up for that, like down on South Road and um, in, in Musquash and so forth. Um, some kind of mitigation, uh, I think, would be reasonable. <clears throat> uh, now, what that is, that's up to staff to take a look at. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Um, I think it's fair um, uh, to do a, well, let me ask you guys a question first. So on your temporary impacts, what, what is your mitigation process right now on a temporary impact? What do you do to bring that back to what it was before your impact? So on a, on a temporary buffer impact, John, do you know what or comprise that mat, temporary matting in a buffer is? But what's the nature of the temporary? The, yeah, in, it would be in, pretty, pretty much timber matting. It's most it would most likely be a timber matting. So that would be if there's any necessary grading. Yeah, uh, we do seed if necessary. Oftentimes, if we're talking about a vegetated area within the right-of-way court, there's enough native veg vegetation there. So I, I would. That's my question. Is is mostly to the vegetation itself. Right. Um, you know, if you do make a temporary impact and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure there's a lot of native species in there, sumacs, right. blueberries, uh, do you look to replant that or are you just coming through and cleaning it up and putting grass seed down? If there's, um, generally we don't need to do other than uh, seeding as, as more of a stabilization measure, measure yeah. with grass. Yep. Uh, generally that native vegetation will take right over. The, yeah, will the, the, reclaim itself relatively quickly right, with what's there. Right. The um, permanent buffer impact that we are incurring via gravel access roads and gravel pads, permanent gravel pads, will revegetate. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I dare I say there may even be some quote unquote rare plants that will revegetate. Um, a licorice goldenrod is one that comes to mind. Um, in this I-158 corridor was our W-144 circuit. I want to say that was done on the order of maybe 10 years ago. Uh, that has vegetated beautifully um, in, in sections. So, um, so much of the vegetated earth, the, on itself with no outside of your standard practice of stabilization with right. a seed for erosion control. Right. There has been no. Uh, additional measures of replanting native species anything like that not to my knowledge on that project there have been times where we have done that and i my understanding as a practice there have been times we have put down seed mix on top of gravel mm -hmm. and there has been some success with that um you know that in, in a within say a 50-foot buffer wouldn't be opposed to that necessarily is it okay. is it necessary you know it will will nature do its thing as well I, I'm it will it yeah. does take time yep okay um, <clears throat> I would be comfortable with a condition on putting the gates in as per the recommendation through uh, the Conservation Commission um, I think there is some some merit in what what they had discussed about something similar to fund um, the Conservation Commission I don't think this is the, really the appropriate time to go about that I think staff should look into creating a metric if, if that's a, a direction we want to move in but there's a lot more conversation there that needs to happen before we would we would get into anything of yeah, that, I'd let that staff nature. handle, uh, handle yeah, that because absolutely of negotiating <clears throat> absolutely um, so I think put putting down um, I'd like to see those gravel pads come down come up sooner than later 
Mm -hmm. They tend to be a little slower than everything else. So if we can speed that up by throwing some, you know, 20 bucks worth more seed down around around there, I think that's a good idea um, as well to try and speed that up. Yep. Because they can be unsightly. Absolutely. Um, but um, but other than that, we're good to go. Fantastic. So I will, um, <clears throat> I'm going to read this. I'll, I'll accept a motion. I got to change it up a little bit for our, uh, our uh, math error here, but I'll accept a motion. You want me to read it? Yeah, if you could. Do you know the, yep. you know the total? Perfect. Yep. <clears throat> now, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to uh, grant approval of the conditional use permit with uh, the added conditions as discussed for 132,612 square feet of temporary wetland impacts. 10,472 square feet of permanent wetland impacts, 18,327 square feet of temporary wetland buffer impacts, and 114,222 square feet of permanent wetland buffer impacts for the replacement and maintenance of existing overhead transmission line structures located within the conservation overlay district in the existing T158 transmission line right of way in the area of Page Road, zoned AR1, Public Service Company of New Hampshire, DBA Eversource Energy applicant. I have a motion, I'll take a second. Second. Motion by Lynn, second by Art. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? And uh, the there are no abstentions, chair votes in affirmative. Your CUP is passed. Thank you very much just for your time. Note, Appreciate it. Just note there's seven voting members because Sean is uh, still in his meeting. Yeah. Yes. So past seven zero. All right. One second here to catch up on our agenda. <clears throat> so we have a public hearing on an application for formal review of the Village on Technology Hill planned unit development PUD master plan. Londonary Holdings LLC is the owner and applicant. Map twenty eight. Lot 31-6, 29-2, and map 17. Lots 2, 5-3, 5-4, and 5-5. All right. Um, I am looking for a motion on completeness. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion to accept the application as complete as outlined in staff's recommendation memorandum dated April 10th, 2024. And I'll take a second. I'll second, Mr. Chair. All right, I have a motion by Lynn, second by Art. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? And the chair votes in the affirmative, and the motion passes seven to zero. All right. And note the 65 uh, day time your, frame. Yeah, and, uh, uh, public hearing starts. Your public hearing process has started, as well as the 65 day time frame for the board to render a decision. All right, gentlemen, hello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Dick Anagnost. I'm the co-developer of um, the Village on Technology Hill, which is the project before you tonight. Also with me tonight are Ken and Grace Solinsky, the primary developers and landowners, our engineer Nick Golan from TF Moran, uh, Jamie Neef from Stone River Architects, and Kevin Smith, our development consultant, all at your disposal for potential questions that you may have. By way of background, I'd like to just give you a one-minute history lesson on the site itself and our involvement in it. Ken and Grace founded Insight Technologies, which you may know, located in Londonderry since 1988, essentially on the parcel in front of the one we're discussing tonight. My involvement with them came back in 1989 or 90 when Evans Technology Park, which is the Akira Way subdivision, industrial subdivision was the very first industrial subdivision I ever developed. Um, they grew the company to over 1,100 employees and developed it and built the Insight Technology buildings in that subdivision. Um, they ultimately sold the company to L3 Harris, who still remains there today in 2010. So therefore, between them and myself, we have a really good working knowledge of the area and, and the parcels that we're developing. A couple other landmark projects that you might know that I've built in Londonderry or developed is uh, the Elliott Health System on Budrick Road and the um, EFI Electronics Imaging on Pettengill Road. 
The Village at Technology Hill is located essentially off Kitty Hawk Landing in Akira Way. It consists of currently seven parcels which will be consolidated into approximately plus or minus 110 acres which meets the PUD requirement, which is why we're before you tonight. Um, we've laid it out and designed it in a village concept, which <coughs> essentially the definition of a village concept is live, work, play. Okay, you have um, jobs, you have industry, you have um, services, you have residential, all lo co-located within the same um, large parcel that we're proposing. Um, upon approval of the PUD, we would be prepared to move forward with um, consolidation and site plan review immediately. Um, I know that you're all familiar because you were talking about Woodmont Common earlier and it's been around for a long time. So Woodmont Commons is the other PUD that you're probably most familiar with. But although we would share PUD status, um, we're definitely a project of a different nature. Um, Woodmont, first of all, we're much smaller than Woodmont Commons. Second of all, we have identified and located on the site all of our potential uses. So what you're going to see during site plan and what you're going to see tonight is all of the uses that we're proposing. We've identified them up front. We've located them on the site where they're going to be on a permanent basis. There'll be no reason to come back before the board, except potentially for minor site plan issues for a couple of the buildings that won't be built initially and are being preserved for, um, for future phases of development. Um, Because we're going to be developing so much of the site initially, all of the infrastructure, all of the drainage, all of the roadways, and all of the amenity improvements will be installed all at one time up front but while, during and while the buildings are being built. A large portion of the industrial space, which is another unique thing from Woodmont Commons, is going to be um, occupied by Envision Technology, one of Ken and Grace's latest business ventures. The site also in, will include a uh, small office building which will house their family office and a building for On Point Systems which is another company that they founded. So we have the tenants up front that will be major occupying the majority of the space. Um, Envision Technology is a really innovative company. It's focused on developing and producing electro-optical systems which helps their customers detect, see, and locate their targets. This is clean manufacturing. There are no major chemical deliveries. There is no smoke coming out of smokestacks. This is good, clean manufacturing that we're proposing here. The facility will employ up to 1,300 at full capacity, which will create essentially 1,100 new jobs that will be brought into the London, London area. The second component of the village is the residential component. It comprises 439 housing units spread over nine buildings. The largest challenge, which I'm sure you're all aware of because Londonderry is suffering it just like all the other areas of New Hampshire, is facing employers, is attracting and hiring um, workers. And that's difficult because of the lack of housing available to the workers. Our thought here is that primarily we will be servicing our own um, crews, our own executives, our own employees with the housing. So as part of the manufacturing process and our hiring process, we'll be offering housing to go along with it. Um, there's very little housing, as you guys know, in the northern part of, of Londonderry. So therefore, by having it available, it moves right into that live, work, play status that I talked about earlier. Um, this will significantly increase the labor pool from which we can draw from, but it also attract labor pool to the neighborhood for our neighbors as well. Um, historically, village concepts are not new. Okay, the mills in Manchester are a village concept. The mill in Londonderry is a village concept. It always started historically with a manufacturer or a business establishing itself and then its workers building housing all around it in order to pl supply the workforce. So essentially we're just going back in time and reviving a concept that successfully worked for centuries. Um, 
the housing is going to be a mixture, so therefore we can accommodate engineers, line item em line employees, as well as our executives. The next largest challenge facing employees and our ability to hire them, and this again, I'm sure is well known in Londonderry as well, is a lack of child care availability. The third facet of our village concept is we will be providing a 9,200 square foot child care building to provide child care for our employees and for our residents on site. And then lastly, in order to um, mitigate or minimize the number of trips that need to be made to and from the site for various minor necessities, we're proposing a 15,000 square foot commercial building. And in that commercial building, we are looking at somewhat which we historically characterized as neighborhood retail. So a small general store, a place that you can pick up things that you need, a uh, breakfast, lunch place, so that you could get your coffee before you went to work and those kinds of things. So it'll carry a wide variety of convenience items and product lines. You know, there might be a hair salon or a barber there or a small gym or those types of uses um, that would complement and allow that for their services to be provided to the um, employees in that area of both our buildings and uh, the other, our abutters, as well as our um, apartment dwellers. Um, we've conducted a fiscal impact study, which we submitted to the town already as part of our site plan development, um, the results of which are very positive, and we are very tax favorable to the town as an overall project. You know. Overall, our services won't just, and what we've just presented to you, won't just service us, but there's a number of other large employers in the direct area. There's L3 Harris, uh, Inselectro, um, Kluber Lubrication, Wire Belt, NS1, Admix. You know, there's other employers on Kitty Hawk and Harvey Road, Ricker Avenue, Tinker Avenue, and Abbey Road that would all have direct access to everything that we're proposing here tonight. So without further ado, I've bored you enough with an introduction. I'll turn it over to the guy that really has the details. Go ahead, Nick. Right, Nick, thanks. before you get going, I just want to ask staff if they have any input on anything they've heard so far. I'm good. Kelly. Mr. Chair, I thought it might be helpful to both the public and the board if I could just say a few comments about just PUD process in general. Sure. So I, I created a small chart to show kind of where, how we got to where we are today, but essentially um, we're here. We're at the public hearing stage. So we've determined that the PUD is complete, meaning it's meeting the minimum requirements of 100 contiguous acres. They've provided um, the associated documentation per the PUD section of the Lunderry Zoning Ordinance. And so again, we're at the first public hearing stage to have the board go through the, the process of potentially approving the PUD master plan document. The PUD master plan document is the regulatory framework for the forthcoming site plans associated with this master plan. So the applicant cannot proceed with a formal site plan submission, for example, as it relates to the residential piece of the project until this document has been approved by the planning board. Because again, that is the regulatory document that the applicant needs to utilize and staffing needs to utilize to conduct a proper review. So the purpose of tonight will be to start the process of going through um, and reviewing the waivers and modifications that the applicant has brought forward that you'll see um, outlined in the staff memorandum and, and beginning those discussions and having it back and forth with the applicant as well as hearing from the public. So that's the intention and, and purpose of tonight's hearing. And if I can answer any other questions along the way, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Anything from the board before we keep moving? I have <coughs> one. Sure. So I, I thought I heard that, I, heard, I, th I thought I heard said that, that they would not have to come back here for any other reason once the PUD was approved. But that's not necessarily true, is it? I, I'm not exactly sure what you said verbatim uh, do you, but do you remember what you I said think it, I think what if I heard you right it was that we'll go through the process of establishing the PUD master plan then the applicant will still have to come back for a hearing process for 
the associated site plans. Right. So all if the site have, plans still have to come back correct. here. For but there are portions of the site plans, for example, some of the manufacturing buildings that are phased or that have elements that aren't set in stone yet that they may need to come back to the board for for my interview. I think the purpose of that comment was to point out the difference between Woodmont and this PUD, meaning they have everything almost 100% established with the exception of a couple of buildings that they right. may have to come back for. So in other words, you'll be seeing Technology Hill site plans somewhat consecutively, and please chime in if I'm misinterpreting what you said, but that's more articulate than I could have characterized that. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was the case. I just wanted to clear that up in case someone listening here in the stratosphere uh, mistook what was said, um, similar to the way I did, because I was convinced that the, they need to come back here. So after we something. establish the PUD master <clears throat> document, we will continue to have public hearings on any associated any site, site plan with the PUD. Right. Thank you for the clarification. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Anybody uh, else? Yeah. Uh, the fiscal impact uh, analysis report, when was that submitted? Um, it was just submitted for review by staff. Oh, okay. um, it hasn't been, or has it been? Site plan. I have reviewed it. If the board has further questions or needs additional documentation, tonight would be the appropriate venue to begin those questions and discussions. Okay. Would it be available for the board to review? It's in your um, it's in it's in your, yeah, it's Oh, okay. I haven't yeah. got that far yet, so I apologize. So, <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. All right, Nick. Certainly, I'll take it away. I'll get a microphone here. Kelly, do you happen to have the overall PUD graphic? If not, I do have a flash drive that has it on it. Otherwise, um, I think so. And that is. Do you need to know what page it's on? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. I got, got it. it. All right, perfect. All right, well, good evening, folks. Um, I'm extremely excited to be here to talk about this project. Um, we're not quite at the culmination here of it, but we have been working on this project for a considerable amount of time. Um, I want to thank John and, and Kelly for their time and help guiding us through this process to make sure that we had an appropriate understanding of uh, what a PUD meant and how best to orchestrate our submittals. So. <clears throat> As, as Dick mentioned at the opening here, there were certain project objectives. Um, this is an industrial mixed-use uh, project with key components being the ability to walk to work, um, creating well-paying, highly technical jobs. Clean manufacturing was the terminology that was, was used early. These are very technical jobs. Hey, hey could you stop that, please? Excuse stop, me, folks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Folks, if you want to talk, can you just step out for a minute, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, other critically important elements of this project were maximizing green, green space and minimizing our environmental impacts. Um, I think it's really important to note, although this is a 110 acre development, we have 40 acres, 40 acres of this project that will remain there in our existing naturally occurring condition. Um, that, is a, uh, that is evidence of the, the developer's intent really to try and make as cohesive a development as possible um, so that it can fit as best within the constraints of its surrounding as possible. Um, other important elements were creating those recreational opportunities. You'll see there's an abundance of open space, uh, which I'll make sure I address as part of our presentation tonight, um, and really creating what would be a sustaining, sustainable community. Um, we'll talk about the various elements. Uh, Dick did a nice job to give us the preface as to, yes, we have a retail area to better support um, our employers, our employees, providing the opportunity for uh, appropriate, nice housing in the immediate vicinity uh, to these workplaces. Uh, it's just a, a tremendous advantage. And what we can see when we look at our overall planned unit, unit development map here is really the, the overall locations of these, these elements uh, I think it's important to point out just a little bit of this existing lot in itself and what brought this project together. You know, the overall site location relative to surroundings, this is the north side of Londonderry, uh, east of the airport and west of Route 128, where sandwiched right in between Akira Way and Kitty Hawk Landing. Uh, Akira Way being to the north and Kitty Hawk Landing to the south, providing two appropriate points of access and egress uh, to the overall project site noting that the layout of the overall facility and the roadways provides the opportunity to separate 
our trucking and more industrial use traffic from our residential components, uh, which again, it's a mixed use development, but doesn't mean things need to be right on top of each other. It means that we need to design this so it's cohesive and that so these elements can work together. Um, relative to the underlying zoning district, it's important to at least make sure we note that this is industrial one, industrial two, commercial two, and agricultural residential. So much like our project, our underlying zoning districts um, also have a, an abundance of options. Uh, Dick mentioned in his opening that there are seven lots that will be consolidated in order to accommodate the 110 acres overall for this project site. Um, just from a uh, just overall discussion point of the existing site features, um, you'll notice from our plan there's some, some grayed out areas which represent our proposed impervious, but you'll also note some lighter graded uh, areas that are also an off color of green. Those are some existing wetlands. Um, those wetlands um, exist in multitude in several locations, so it really became a, a difficult design topic as to how best to site our uses to minimize our environmental impacts. Um, there's also over 120 feet of grade change working from the east side of the site where the proposed Envision 160 building will be to the westerly most point where we have our residential units. This again helped drive how this site would be designed, noting that we have to have the appropriate runout on those roads to provide um, grade transitions that are appropriate, um, also dealing with um, providing appropriate stormwater management facilities and separation from estimated seasonal high groundwater, really in allowing Mother Nature to dictate where those elements would need to be placed. So overall, talking about the different land use areas, I'll give us a little, at least an overview. Uh, that first land use area is our village area one. Um, this area is intended to be the gateway to the development and contains our commercial uses. Um, these commercial uses really address the daily needs of our residents and the employees of the village. Um, so as we come in off of Akira Way, directly uh, to the left side of the drawing would be the retail area. Um, again, as Dick mentioned, this is a, this is a general retail. Maybe it's a, a sandwich shop. Uh, this provides uh, maybe a hair salon. Um, just various uses that allow the folks that live here to take a walk to go take care of what they need to versus hopping in their car. Um, that's very much an important component of this project in that we have, provides us the opportunity to take vehicles off the road um, and promote really more of an ecological effect when it comes to this overall development. Um, directly across from our access road is our child care area. Um, again, these two uses have been very much strategically located adjacent to Kiraway. Um, provides the opportunity for those areas to be used not only by uh, the individuals who live in our development, but for folks who live outside of it. And it also provides the opportunity for them to use those businesses without coming to the interior of the development. They don't need to drive through the residential area, they don't need to drive through the manufacturing areas in order to best utilize those services. Um, our second area, uh, as we work our way south, uh, there will be a slightly cambered bridge that will cross. Um, that is an element that has been provided both for aesthetic but also for environmental reasons and that it allows us to avoid any wetland impacts of the existing wetland channel um, that is in that, that location. Uh, that elevated bridge provides the opportunity for critter crossings as well. Uh, that was one item that in meeting with your conservation commission in reviewing uh, this project was definitely identified as a very important factor that this is a, a critter corridor and we need to make sure that we provide the ability for that interconnection. Um, Relative to that residential, which is the next portion as we cross the overall bridge, um, what you'll find is this is essentially a concentric ellipsoid formation enabled by the internal roadway configuration. Essentially, we have a high loop and we have a low loop, and it allows us to better play off the existing topography of the site, as well as make use of the existing resource, resources that we have, i.e. ledge, to make use of that on the site for our road selects. Um, the other thing that it does, which we're particularly proud of, is it creates this beautiful center green. Um, we're not just talking about this being um, a development. This is really a village <coughs> unto itself. So it provides great common space, um, both path passive and active uh, within that area for uh, all of the community uh, within this area to be able to use. Um, as we work our way from the west to the east, uh, you can see there's a little bit of a transition where we go from our, our residential buildings into some areas that are more strategically laid out for parking lots and our industrial uses. Um, to the south, uh, we have our on-point building and the Envision technology building. Um, the expectation is Envision continues to grow. They'll be able to grow out of that space and provide other supplementary uses. 
when they move into their larger building, which is in the northeast quadrant. Um, that building has been designed for their future needs, as well as additional expansion that would allow them to cantilever out over the parking lot that would be used during initial phases of the project. Um, there is also an additional manufacturing use located in the northeast quadrant. Um, when Dick mentioned that, that there's a, a little bit of an unwritten element to this project, it's essentially that building. Um, how that building eventually comes to maturation, uh, we're working through, but the expectation is that would be a building that would provide really a sister use um, to the other compatible uses that already exist on site. Can I ask you a question before? Yes, ma'am. Which building is that? The one in the uh, northwest, northeast corner? Yep. So or the, the very one top on the east side. Very top of the page. Okay, thank you. Great. Right twenty thousand square feet. Yep. 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 So it's identified as a twenty thousand square foot manufacturing use. How exactly? How exactly that plays out will uh, fetter out as part of the site plan approval process, as well as the environmental permitting that will be associated with the project. Thank you. Very good. Um, and last but not least, we have the Slinsky Foundation Building. So this provides Ken and Grace really a home base for their office use um, to continue with their philanthropic needs. Um, kind of the crow's nest to look out over the development as well, make sure everything's running as smoothly as possible. Um, overall, when we look at it, we have nearly 400,000 square feet of manufacturing building. So that is the primary end use here. here. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, the the corollary is that we have the opportunity now to provide the, the housing for the employees for this area. Now, what does it mean to be a PUD? It, it's straightforward as to the ordinance. You need 110 acres to start, and then there's a list of information that you need to provide, which we've provided in our uh, the Village on Technology Hill Bible as far as our PUD. Now, there are development guidelines. I think it's important that I, may, I just touch on a couple of those. Um, stormwater management. This is primarily going to be a closed drainage system that will outlet to open infiltration areas. A uh, system of testing is conducted in all of those locations to make sure that the soils are appropriate for receiving that stormwater. Um, from a layout standpoint, I did make mention of uh, open space and that we have both uh, an active use, that being our community building. Um, we have passive areas, that being the center green. Um, as well as just other conservation areas. There's nearly 40 acres, again, that aren't being touched. Provides the opportunity for nature trails, park courses, uh, opportunities for the people that work and live in this area to utilize the surrounding, but to do so in a positive way. Um, from a landscape perspective, um, we're fairly consistent with your regulations. I think there's only one, there's one minor departure as it relates to parking lots, in that when we look at this overall design, the residential areas in and of themselves, you don't see a traditional you know, 100, 200 space parking lot like you do with the more industrial type uses. Street parking. Um, it's intended to be more of a residential layout feel so that it is a community. Um, relative to those roadways and that parking, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention there is a traffic study that'd be associated with this project. That traffic study was scoped with the town staff. Um, the traffic study has been completed <coughs> and it's been submitted for review. Uh, our expectation is that the ultimate approval would be done in, in accordance with the site plan approvals for this project. Um, there are always changes to square footages, um, minor elements that require revision, so it seems most appropriate that that traffic study be approved uh, in connection with the site plans that are submitted. Uh, I think it's very important that this was included, though, as part of our overall package and that it's known that there has been an evaluation done. It has been scoped with the town. Um, it's not this uh, ubiquitous item that, was, that is an unknown. Um, we have a clear understanding of the traffic impacts that would be associated with this project. Now, I've mentioned uh, here and there throughout the presentation that there are a couple of departures from the regulations. Uh, the original submittal of the PUD asked for 20 such departures. Uh, we've since whittled that down to 16 with uh, the help of staff in an acknowledgement that several of them were simply not required. Um, areas in which we're asking for uh, departures we don't have to ask then for a departure to have the departure essentially. So there were four items that were able to be immediately eliminated. Um, before I talk too much about those elements, so I think it'd be good to, stick, would you mind speaking a little bit to the architecture? I think you were one of the focal points in the conversation we had um, with the Heritage Commission. Sure, so back in December, we appeared before the Heritage Commission. The um, exemplars are in your um, package of what we presented. Um, we're still refining the architecture at this point to design into buildings. It's tough to go much further without. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Let me make it easier and face you. <laughs> um, 
So as I was saying, the um, architecturals were well received by the Heritage Commission. We received some positive feedback. We've incorporated the elements that they um, brought up um, during that meeting. We would be re-communicating with the Heritage Commission as we go through the site plan process. Um, we have Stone River Architects with us tonight. Um, they will be with us throughout the entire process. They're further developing um, all of the floor plans and construction documents as we speak. Um, one of the benefits of having a project of this magnitude and having the um, essentially blank canvas with which to start is you'll note that the um, apartment buildings which are usually peaked roofs have flat roofs. We intend this project to be fully solar as much as we can produce. So there'll be solar on top of the apartment buildings as well as all of the industrial buildings that you saw which will give us an opportunity to generate a significant amount of power and all of that power for the most part will be utilized on site. We'll still have to supplement some from the grid but we're attempting to generate as much power as we possibly can and be the end user of that power. With Nick's very articulate presentation you can see that the uses, although different, and typically historically, you find the residential and residentially zoned neighborhood and the industrial and industrially zoned neighborhood. You can see how the uses are symbiotic and they work together. Okay, and that essentially is the essence of a village concept, where you cluster all kinds of different uses to support one another in the overall process. So, stay tuned during site plan. We'll be doing full architectural presentation. Um, if you have any questions tonight, like I said, our architect is present. However, we did receive very positive feedback from the Heritage Commission. You have copies of the initial presentations in your in your package, and we'd be happy to answer any further questions regarding architecture. Hey, Dick. Board, board have any questions on architecture? I think the, the, the buildings are very handsome. Yeah, and I good. like I like very much on the. Uh, residential building, um, the the architectural feature that uh, the peaked roof, which I think, which I think created a, a little bit of a problem for you, <laughs> on, on height by ten feet. But I'm very confident that our fire department has a hose that will shoot water ten feet, so I'm not that worried about it. Um, the only thing I would say about that that residential building is uh, it's hard to tell on this. Um, cartoon drawing because that's kind of kind of what it is um, if there's any kind of cornice on top of that building just to draw the height down a little bit and if that was possible I know you're gonna have you know solar and photovoltaics PVs and, and whatever on top of there that you don't want to detract from but I think that would add a, a little spice to the building as well um, but other than that I, I think the buildings um, are quite nice looking and frankly uh, the only people that will see them are the people that are going into the development and you would really need to go in there for a specific purpose so um, you know it is what it is but uh, thank you to the architect for um, putting together some nice visuals for us if I may address something mr. chair absolutely um, you're right we had asked for a 10-foot differential it's really a five-foot differential and at the top, so the buildings are really 46 feet um, to the roof line, and there's a parapet that comes up that essentially hides everything that's on the roof, including the solar panels themselves. But it's really only a differential of five feet, and the reason that we chose to go for the waiver of the five feet is because we have an area where we're providing full access for firemen, for inspection, for maintenance on the solar thing. So what it is, it's a stair tower essentially that rises five feet above that roof line that is the reason for the waiver. Sure, and when you come back with your buildings, you'll, the fire department will weigh in on it anyway, so. Absolutely. Um, yes, as the site plan, there'll be a lot greater detail that gets, uh, gets applied. Jason? Um, I had I, a comment I, about um, hold on one the second. design. Jason? I, I've, I want to echo Tony's on the architecture. I think it looks great. Um, my only question is, with the solar, did you check with the airport about any reflection? Because that is coming in right on a flight path. So. We have, and the building directly down in front of us also has solar already. But we have 
checked with the airport. Okay, thank you. Ann? I, um, I was surprised you were saying uh, something about cohesive design because um, you vary between contemporary and colonial, basically. Uh, why not carry one theme over um, the whole development? Like you have a great um, contemporary building in the Solinsky building, and then the industrial buildings look uh, um, pretty appropriate along with that building. I'm wondering why you went with uh, you didn't go with that for the whole theme of the um, you know the businesses out at the street and the child care center and the residences. Forgive me, I'm going to go way out on a limb here. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that because I'm just questioning because it seems so, uh, you know, odd that you'd have contemporary and also more traditional together like that. I'm going to put words in the architect's mouth now, and he's probably going to come up here and hit me. He's, he's actually he's, he's trying he's not to get out there. <laughs> 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 you, got him, you got him squirming. Mm -hmm. and, I, yeah, he's I mean, squirming even already. If, even if you went mid-mod or something like that. I mean, so all we're looking to pick up some of the colonial history of the town of Londonderry while providing a modern contemporary look to it. Okay, so thereby you have the mixture of the two styles, and if I said anything out of turn, he's going to come running up here right now. Anything you want to say? You're good. Okay. Great. Can you believe in that for now? Sure. <laughs> okay. If you're happy, I'm happy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Keep on going. Okay. So, relative to us, that that is really the formal part of our presentation. Um, the reality is we realize we have some departures. Those are things you'd like to hear about, and we're happy yeah. to take those in order if we'd yep. like to do that. Or if there are just other general questions we wanted to address before we jump into those, uh, whatever the board's favor is. I think we got our questions right now out of the way. And you look like you might have I one. have something about the whole document. Do you want me to save it for later? Or? Yeah, save, save it for a little later. Let's, okay. let's go through the, the next stuff here and then uh, hold on to that till we get okay. bring it back to the board. Okay. Well, if... If it's okay, what I'll do is I'll, I'll use the uh, staff memorandum as our agenda, and we'll go right through it. That'd be great. Um, so relative to the first item, which is Section 5.1, which is the residential development phasing. So uh, in order to support the housing needs of our employees associated with the applicant's businesses, as well as combat the ongoing housing crisis, which we know to be uh, an element, the applicant is seeking a modification to Section 513F of the ordinance to allow creation of up to 200 dwelling units per year from the date of site plan approval. Uh, this timing is consistent with the anticipated uh, building timeline identified within the PUD, which would see the construction of the project over a span of four years. Um, as Dick had mentioned in his opening, we're coming in, uh, the idea is to rough grade the site, install the necessary infrastructure, our roadways, um, the drainage components, um, and then it's just a system of getting each one of those housing units online to then be able to support the businesses. If we followed the ordinance, which only allows um, 20 per calendar year, we'd only be able to get up about half a building a year, and we'd be uh, under a very long duration in order to see this project come to fruition. Um, so the request is for 200 units a year in lieu of the 20 that's identified in the ordinance. How many units are in a building? Um, it does vary. Um, I think at our largest, we have 55, and at the smallest, it's 43. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So just so that yeah. the, the uh, so that the board understands again. So Nick's initial request of these that are in the PUD, they were so they were very broad brush. Yes. And again, so when Kelly and I looked at this, it's like, what it's what specifically are you asking a waiver to? So we spoke with Nick last week, and Nick has refined it. He did provide us. And I haven't had an opportunity to, to uh, look at what he's refined it to. So this evening I have no comment. Now that, it, now that, now that he has a better understanding, I'll, we'll have a better understanding. And as he indicated, there's some things he was asking a waiver for that there's yeah, no need, need for it. <laughs> believe it or not. So. Yeah. No. I, I have to thank again. I got to thank Kelly and John. They took the time to to reach out and say, hey, you know. Pretty broad brushes in a, lot, in a few areas. Can, can we tighten up the verbiage here so the board has a better understanding? So we've taken that opportunity. So Mother Nature gave us an extra week 
uh, with the board meeting being canceled last week. So it's given us the opportunity to really go through the ordinance, refine the nature of our request so we could be much more poignant about what we're needing. So I'll, I'll be able to read those elements as I started to um, relative to these. So Kelly, you look like you had something you wanted to say. I just wanted to add that for the purposes of tonight, the board should have a discussion on this item and, and yeah. give the applicant some type of consensus or direction about what the board is is thinking on this particular <clears throat> on each modification yeah absolutely and I, I think maybe while we go we'll let them read one we'll go through it instead of holding all our questions for the end we'll go one by one here That'd be great. Um, I believe you said correct me if I'm wrong you said 200 units yes sir per year um, board have any input on that <clears throat> couple questions <clears throat> so how long does it take to build 200 units well Given today's yep, economic right. conditions with uh, workforce and everything else in the building community? Well, we believe that we've lined up the workforce. We have a general contractor already aboard as a um, construction consultant and construction manager. Um, we've sequenced them so that essentially while the infrastructure is being installed, mm -hmm. as each pad becomes ready, it will go into a sequence so that the buildings will follow one another. Okay, the time frame to get the first building is probably, a, I mean, there's probably close to 10 months to a year of site work. Okay, we probably wouldn't start a building until we were at least 8 to 10 months in. Then it would take 10 months to bring the first building online. Okay, so that Sorry, gives you a schedule. Time, 10 months? To about approximately 10 months <laughs> to bring the first building online. You could say that's, once you get to that first building, it's going to take about 10 months. You, you're would you say it's about a 10 month average per building from there no from that point forward mr butler it would be approximately 60 days because what we would do is we start drop a foundation start framing that building continue the site down drop another foundation okay so they would be going in sequence in that <clears throat> manner none of them would be coming online all at the same time they'd probably be coming online between a, a eight and a ten week period between one another um, also, at that same time, we're ramping up. We'll be building the original Envision building. So we'll be ramping up employees so we'll have ready product for the employees when they come to work. So we're going to kind of time the first couple of buildings along with the first Envision building to be simultaneous with one another so that we have the housing available for... Housing for the staff of the building. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, that was my other question. <clears throat> as to how you're going to be phasing that out with building the uh, the industrial buildings. So, exactly. good. Yeah, but Woodmont has a waiver. Also. Yep. So, so your waiver will, will, you want to be released from phasing, but you want to phase, but you want to phase now. So the manner in which the ordinance spells it out is it says for our type of development, it would only allow up to Two, uh, 20 units. 20, right. We're saying in lieu of asking for a waiver, we just want to modify that and say, can we do up to 200 units um, in lieu of the 20? So if you got up to 200, then you're talking about 200, then another year, or 200, and then the rest, the third year. Essentially, with the give, give or take. units total. So full build out is approximately 48 months. So if we can get 200 in the first year, the rest will follow directly into that timeline. Does 48 months include your first year of site work? Yes. yes. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I just add a comment. The way that the standard is written now, based on the 20 units per year, it states um, that's from the date of final approval. So if the board is considering modifying this um, request, you might want to consider when you start the timeline, meaning do you want it to be from the date of the final approval of the residential site plan, or do you want it to be from a different time frame? Yeah. So the issue with phasing came up, and you all know this, but I'm, I'm talking to other people. <laughs> uh, the topic of phasing came in to try and protect the school district and the taxpayers from, from a sudden influx of X number of children that, that they didn't have space for, room for, teachers for, or whatever. That was the whole idea of phasing. You all know that. Um, the, 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 the number of children per unit has gone down according to Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, and I believe it was 0 0.17. 0 0.17 per, per unit for multifamily houses. Per unit from, from, for multis. 
So in this case, if you went to 200, that's 34 kids a year, um, which comparatively speaking, if the school district has a year in advance for site work, can plan for. If they actually hit the 0.17, which I think it's been lower than that, but um, in in Londonderry, but um, so uh, as as one person, I think that uh, adding for this ad asking for this 200 per in phasing, um, I don't think affects the school district much um, with the one year advance notice because of the site work, knowing that there's going to be another 200 the next year right so yeah the fiscal I'm, I'm impact okay analysis notes that yes i think it's be lower than that yeah so i'm i'm okay i i'm glad that it's going to be phased instead of just the 400 um and i and i think it's okay i think it's safe okay. uh, again there's a, a 12 month window there too that that the school can prepare right. and say hey we're, we we should expect x amount of kids the next school year correct mm -hmm. Jason um, <clears throat> I agree with you I, I think the phasing is but um, I think we're more likely to see a higher number of kids per children per unit here simply because of the on-site child care that's going to be a, a value add for a lot of people so I think we're likely to see more families that have kids so I, I, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a deal breaker or anything but I think we're probably going to see more than that 0.17 per unit if I may make a point, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Um, just remember that those children dispersed over 12 grades. So. Right. Yeah. 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 That's the point. That's why. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to that point about the child care, that also gives the school district an additional metric to look at to I say. What's coming if up. That, because they know all the child care places around. Now you're going to have another one. If they know there's 11 three-year-olds mm -hmm. in there from that development and they they have access to that information then that's additional planning that they have uh to use it's almost right. another tool that's in their toolbox to prepare for for what's ahead of them correct yeah i, I don't then, i don't view that additional number as like being yeah. it's going to suddenly flood the schools I, right. well yeah you also have to kind of i mean when we think about the school district and we so i'm looking at this and uh that daycare center, that's huge. That's, that's huge for this development, huge for our community. Um, I'm also looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, by by law, we we provide um, what London Dairy calls LEAP services, special education services for um, school age students that are that have identified there. You know, so those are mostly identified in the preschool setting funding is available we have Moose Hill that houses that our town recently had two um, um, two Warren articles where the citizens the citizens, the citizens did not approve a, you know, an expansion of that of that Moose Hill building um, that Moose Hill building right now has four modules where where kindergartners are learning in and you know so there's a lot to do in that building um, I'm you know, this whole plan here it, it's exciting right that live work play aspect that you that you worked on I remember being on the board of um, the live work play governor Lynch initiative 10 15 years ago when I was a young professional Gosh, but this is exactly kind of like the, these innovative type, you know, aspects that are kind of um, where London area is absolutely attracting that. Um, I'm looking at your estimated school age children. I apologize. I'm just looking at it. Um, you know, I'm looking at the report right now, just received it right now. Um, so I and I do look that you did, you did, you have used McGregor Cut and Main Street at Woodmont as kind of your your basis to, you know, um, to estimate those um, enrollments. I, you know, and you know, as the reports laying out here, we are seeing a decline. I'm 
this is the type of development that potentially could you know, have that nominal increase that may not be a, we may not be seeing in this in this data here. Um, so that's I just want to call that out because I think it's important of kind of you understanding where our town is on you know, on, um, on capital expenditures. The school district also and you may we uh, when you um, met with Superintendent Black there. Um, also, two years ago, released a, um, a master facility study. You know, the cliff notes, all of our district um, buildings need renovations, significant renovations to educate 21st century students. Um, so I'm going down the path of we want to increase here. We want to definitely, um, you know, you know support her. You know, support our you know, our youth and our, our students and this is the type of development that definitely does that um, so uh, you know if we definitely have another conversation on this I'd like to really kind of you know, um, you know, focus in on you know these estimates and where we're kind of seeing that because if I'm a young professional looking to move to Londonderry work in one of these high income tech you know what um, tech you know, tech jobs, I want to raise a family here. Um, you know, I'm right off 93. You know, I have this convenience store uh, that, you know, I can get my, you know, my stuff. Uh, you know, I can put my child in child care. But, I, man, I, I, I want to, like, walk to work. I want to kind of do all that. And, you know, I want my kids to be very passionate, you know, kind of be very um, involved with the school communities in that so I really kind of think you know, maybe you know, it could be an opportunity to relook at that um, those estimates and you know kind of account for yeah, kind of the visibility of Londonderry and where it is and you know you know those you might see you may see a jump in the number of school-aged children that this supports so if I may mr. chair so when we looked at it and one of the reasons and you articulately and hit the nail on the head with respect to the child care it's not just the availability of child care to our employees and our residents it's also taking the pressure off the school district by providing them with a steady pipeline but also a significant amount of communication back and forth mm -hmm. Ken and Grace's vision of this project is that it's somewhat self-sufficient, okay? That's why the impact study was, the fiscal impact study was so important because we are so tax positive, you could double the amount of children and you'd still be making money on right, this project. Right, yeah, that, that, tech, that tax positive number there is, that's, right. that's nice. Their intent after being already in this, somewhat very close in this location for over 30 years and being a good corporate resident in town of Londonderry is essentially to leave a permanent legacy here. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing before you is a legacy project. Okay, it's well designed, it's well thought out, it's symbiotic in use, it's innovative. It has both modern and colonial architecture. I mean, <laughs> a lot of thought and effort has been put into this by top consultants. So um, just being the lowly developer that gets up here and essentially explains it all. I'm very proud to be part of this project for those reasons. I've never heard him call me top consultant. So I, yeah. really <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anybody call you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. I mean, I definitely appreciate that. But it's, uh, we definitely, and I'm definitely not questioning that, not questioning the work. I'm just kind of seeing you know, other da you know, data that's also, um, you know, we didn't definitely see not only our, you know, not only you know, Moose Hill, but North School was also definitely on that feasibility study that you know that had a lot of different kind of needs to it, um, and that and that's where these you know students would you know spend their elementary years. Roger, Thank you you. you looked like you had one. Yeah, I just I have a comment more than anything. One of the things obviously is the effect on the school system here is important and something that perhaps you might already have, but maybe you should have from your company a liaison with the school system. Uh, not just to keep them informed so they know 
as the steps are coming up. I'm sure we all will, but a direct liaison is always good. Yeah, we'll make a note of that. I, you know, I mean, there's... That's what Who you would liaison with, I'm not sure, but somebody in the school system. Start with the superintendent. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. That's Tell kind it. of the role I was um, referring to with respect to the daycare center. Yeah. Okay, that they would be in regular contact with the school system and thereby um, be providing them with up-to-date data of exactly what's going on within our project. Well, one of the more relevant things as you're building up the, this, the daycare center isn't there yet, but the fact is it will have an in, uh, impact. So if the school department knows that it's coming online or that more children are coming in, that's all. That's what I was looking at. Okay. Kelly? I just wanted to add, Mr. Chair, that um, both myself and the <coughs> town manager have been in communication with the superintendent of the schools, and we preliminarily um, discussed this project with Dan Black. Um, it was very, you know, early stages, but we did highlight the density, um, the daycare element, and we continue to provide that type of data to the school for any project that has a significant number of units, just so that they have an awareness of the potential um, projects in the pipeline. Great, thank you. Anything else from the board? Are we going to sit on this until until staff um, has a comment? Yeah, I, I want to kind of, as they're going through each one, let us get our thoughts out of our head because there's a lot here, mm -hmm. and then go on to the next one, and we'll we'll circle back, bring staff in. Um, there's 31 to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, First one's always the longest. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Just just to touch on what Jeff said, um, you know, I agree with a lot of, a lot of what he did say. There's certainly a concern there. Um, that you know the, the the school district didn't necessarily get some of the, the the capital support they were hoping for, and you know what effect could that have on, or could this development have on that? Knowing that we didn't get already needed space in some of our buildings as we stand today, you know what could an additional thirty or forty kids do on that? Um, but but I will uh, I'd be ready to to move on to the next one here. Could I just ask a question? Real quick. Uh, we're talking about starting up, and um, I was just wondering, um, when you're talking about the construction starting and the construction equipment, which entrance are you going to use for the heavy equipment to come in? Is it Kira, what, uh, Kira or um, Kitty Hawk? We would be able to have access to it from a Kira way for the retail and child care uses. But otherwise, we need to build our bridge first in order to get across to span to the southerly portions. So that access would be via Kitty Hawk. Excuse me, Lou. So that access would, in, would initially be from Kitty Hawk. Um, and it's something that we're working with our construction manager so that he would be able to help define for us how best to access the areas so they can best build this project as efficiently as possible. Yeah, okay. The goal would was... be, however, and to build from a caraway through to kitty hawk that one sort of main artery that nick yep. is outlining right now okay. that would be the first piece of the infrastructure put in okay and also i'll point out that the first building to be built will actually be the commercial building because we intend to use that as a construction office warehouse and our base for operations we would build that building into the shell we would utilize it on site so you wouldn't have unsightly trailers and all of that kind of stuff, it would give us our base of operations and ultimately at the very end, circle back and turn it into the commercial space. Thank you. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. You want to go on to section six? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, so this is in regards to conditional use permits. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we necessarily need to read through all the preface, but I recommend, I see, do see that staff's recommend granting the waiver, but subject to um, that the exceptional and modified conditional use permits for the conservation overlay district. Um, our request is intended to remove the formal CUP process with the Conservation Commission relating to impacts to the wetland buffers and conservation overlay district. Now, we'll still meet with the Conservation Commission so they can provide us the guidance on the items of importance uh, to the Commission and allow their advisory comments to the Planning Board for consideration. But again, it would just be no formal CUP would be issued. So. This, there's a, I believe, an appropriate reason for this request, and that this approach is requested in, the, in lieu of establishing buffers to existing wetland areas. We've developed the project in an environmentally conscientious manner to avoid wetland impacts 
and preserve large blocks of unfragmented land. Of the 110 some odd acres that we have, we have 950 square feet of wetland impact. And that's only because uh, it was one of the last areas that we delineated and it was right in the middle of our access road. And in order to avoid it, uh, would have had dramatic impacts to the overall project. Um, the, as I had mentioned in the opening, the How layout- How many acres of wetland are in that 110? Uh, I knew that question was coming and I don't have the answer for this evening, um, but I'll make sure that I have that for you for Fair next enough. time. It, when we think of it as a percentage, the amount of wetlands that we're impacting is in the hundreds of a percent. Can you go, that was under a thousand square feet for the entire project? For the, entire, for the entire project. Thank you. Um, so this approach allows for over 40 acres of the 110 acre development to remain in its current existing vegetative state. And we do feel this is consistent with the goals and objectives identified by our PUD, the objectives and characteristics defined in the conservation overlay district, um, and supported by the spirit and intent of the London Dairy Master Plan. Now we've had several meetings with the Conservation Commission. Um, they did provide us a letter of support and our expectation is continue to work with them to make sure we can refine this project to minimize those impacts to the extent practical. Now, this is in regards to section um, six conditional use permits, but it's very tidly, uh, very closely tied to item four, which is section 4.61 relative to conservation overlay districts. So if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, can I take these as yep. one? Absolutely. Um, so we are requesting a modification here. Uh, to provide clarification, uh, what we're proposing is a modification of Section 461 Conservation Overlay Districts. Um, it's not implying uh, temporary wetland impacts to accommodate appropriate work zones adjacent to new structure. What we'd like to do is revise our request to state if granted would allow a retaining wall as close as five feet to the edge of a jurisdictional wetland. This modification is intended to accommodate retaining wall construction and no temporary wetland impacts are requested at this time. Um, in reading our original submittal, and thanks to John for pointing it out, it's, just, it's too broad rush, a structure. Any structure could be within a certain distance of a wetland. That wasn't, in our, wasn't our intention. Our intention was to preserve as much of that wetland and the surrounding area as possible, which those retaining walls allow. Um, you do need a certain construction area. Most of those retaining walls that we do have uh, are preliminary designed in the nature of four to five feet tall. So that provides that one-to-one -one setback so that they could be constructed. Um, our expectation is there uh, beyond that less than thousand square feet of wetland, no other wetlands would be impacted as part of this project. So with those two items in concert that, you know, we've designed this project overall so that we could have these large blocks of, of wetlands that would be able to be remain in their, their current state. We are asking to work closer to them. Uh, what that does essentially is it, it moves that buffer that would otherwise be established um, back up against the wetland of itself, but provides the opportunity for a larger, more cohesive area to remain intact. So that's the nature of our request. Board, have any questions on those two? Want to keep going? All right. Um, section four, uh, excuse me, set, item three, section four, zoning district use tables. Um, this one's rather straightforward. Uh, section 526, permitted use of the ordinance, requires the applicant to identify their applicable zoning district's use tables. We feel this waiver to provide the uses as listed is justified to support the proposed mixed use village. As defined within the PUD, the village on Technology Hill seeks to provide an integrated industrial village that harmonizes work, life, and recreation, and emphasizes growth of the industrial zoning areas near the Manchester, Boston Regional Airport. So all that good stuff that Dick started with is the embodiment of why we're trying to propose these uses. Right. Anything from the board on that? Nine, keep going. Guys. All right. Um, we spoke to number four, number five, section 517, relative vehicle access and parking. Um, what this really is, we're not looking to waive all of section 27, or all of section 517. What we're specifically asking to do is to calculate our parking based off of a specific parking regulation. That being the parking generation manual of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, sixth edition, October 2023, as an appropriate alternative to establish parking requirements. The remainder of the Londonderry standards would be preserved. So this is using the most current regulation and book that our traffic engineers and transportation engineers use to calculate, tra to calculate parking to apply to this facility. Which typically those numbers are less than the town's regulation. It's a fair, fair assessment. 
just to understand. Just say that again. Typically, those regulations are less. Th those numbers that the numbers that are generated using the ITE are, mm -hmm. are less than the towns. Okay. Just so, to, just so you understand so the difference. One thing we will do, and it was a suggestion within the embodiment of the document, was provide you guys a table. What are the differences? So we'll make sure we update our our report to reflect that. Please. Yep. Um, if I may also make a comment, Mr. Chair. So when you're looking at the overall project and you're looking at a live workplace situation, you're not getting the industrial worker coming in and the resident being there at the same time. So there's a overlap of parking that yep. takes place, thereby um, allowing less spaces needed for actual operations. But more importantly, we're trying to eliminate as much impervious surface as we can and keep as much open space and and um, and land in its raw state. So. Yes, it might be less than the standard, but we feel that we can operate with it based on what I just said. And Anybody have any questions? And on I think that? that's what's key, though, too, Dick. Is again, like Nick indicated, you know, put it into a table. That yep. way, it's understandable. Yeah. Yes. You understand. Yeah. Well, I love get tables. It. Absolutely. But um, everyone gets what Ken just said, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So I think that I think that um, I'm more of a green space guy rather than a black space guy. Yep. I think. Throughout the town, we have way too much black space that's being unused, underutilized, or whatever. Um, also, if you look at a project like this philosophically, if you don't have enough parking, you got to live with it. Yeah. The general public really isn't coming in here, and if you don't have enough parking, it really doesn't hurt the general public. You all are going to be up on the hill on top of the rock pile in your own little mess that you got going on if it, if it turns into a mess if, if you're right it's going to be you know symbiotic and, yep. and beautiful and birds will be flying and, and chirping and stuff so um, I, I would rather see less parking than more um, and so I'm, I'm okay with this yep. anything else All right, Keep going. Se section 7 signage um, I'll read this one in totality. The applicant requests a waiver and modification of Section 70 signs. Sign standards for residential, non-residential, and mixed-use areas shall be determined by the terms of Section 29B19 signage of the PUD Master Plan. So we have a little bit more specific request um, in that the intent of the PD, PUD Section 29B19 signage is to clarify and expand upon the Town of Londonderry Zoning Ordinance 7.5 measurement and calculations of area. The PUD will be updated to remove the words with exception to the waiver requests in the paragraphs described in the first paragraph of our PUD and remove the words modifications waiver and replace in the fourth paragraph. This modification is intended to remove any ambiguity from the current regulations. Um, not that we're being overly critical of the current regulations, but relative to the signage areas, if we provide a little bit more detail, I think it'll make it a lot easier for the board and staff moving forward to say this is what was intended. And that's the intent of this, this request. Is there any other parts of our sign ordinance you could help us with, please? <laughs> <laughs> because we need some help on the sign ordinance. Just saying. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, um, if seeing no other further comments, item seven, section two, definitions. Um, again, this one's very much a clarification. The applicant requests a waiver to section two, definitions. To the extent the PUD master plan contains different definitions for terms used in both the Londonderry zoning ordinance and the PUD, and definitions stated in the glossary of the PUD master plan shall prevail. We have one item where there's really a difference. All the other items are really just for clarification we have something along the lines of a park course and planning board and what GIS means and what does general retail building mean. The important one here is building height. Um, what we're asking for is the definition of building height shall be modified as follows. Building height shall not exceed 50 feet, except for structures not intended for human occupancy, parentheses, parapets, solar panels, stairwell roof access, etc., shall not exceed 55 feet. The remainder of the definitions are provided for clarity only and not intended to supersede any definitions in the reference regulation. This gets to what Dick was speaking to earlier. Um, we're not asking for 60 foot tall buildings. We're <coughs> asking for the ability to have a 50 foot tall building, but just clarifying what the intent is of those areas not intended for human occupancy. Right now, there's a couple of listed items in the zoning ordinance. We want to make sure that it's clear that the parapet, solar panels, and stairwell roof access are included within that element. 
You said it was the stairwell roof access was the big one, correct? Yeah, because instead of having a hatch, mm -hmm. we're providing oh, a yeah. full access full for access maintenance, for fire, for all of those kinds of things. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Absolutely. You said a stairwell. Is there going to be um, elevators in the building? Yes. Yes, all of the buildings are elevated. Okay, you don't need any extra roof acts? It doesn't go up that? that high. It stops at the top floor, and then the stairwell goes up from there. Okay, thanks. Okay. Board have any questions on that? Nope. All right, so ends right. the so ends the elements related to the zoning ordinance. So there are there's only a few. Um, in regards to the site plan requirements, uh, items one and two, you may cross off. Um, when we read through this, it was our original understanding that um, we needed to waive this in order to have waivers and modifications in of themselves for the document. It's not the case. Those, those modifications that we are discussing right now are able to stand on their own without the request of a relief of both Section 3.01A, uh, approval of improvements, and Section 3.01C, standards and specifications. Um, I, th the reason why we are having this conversation is I want to make sure that is the case. <laughs> Working with staff, that was our expectation. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had this conversation with the board as well. Essentially, it, we're withdrawing that from the request because it's we don't need to ask for a waiver in order to have the waivers we're asking for. That makes sense. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So that is items one and items two. All right. The third item, and I know this will be John's favorite, section 3.07, storm drain system. Um, so we are requesting a modification. Um, and I'm going to read, this is a little lengthy, so please stick with me. Uh, we anticipate the need to utilize underground detention on the site, which the site plan regulations allow, section 307A1. We also anticipate the need to account for infiltration of stormwater in accordance with state regulations, ENVWQ 1500, alteration of terrain. Considering existing uh, soil conditions and field testing would be done to determine appropriate infiltration rates. Um, although the regulations do not prohibit these practices, prior recommendations from third-party review in the town, of, uh, the town Department of Engineering and Environmental Services um, has typically recommended that certain elements of that not be included um, or have otherwise been exclu we have, uh, have excluded the ability to account for these important practices. Now, what does this result in? Uh, this results in stormwater <coughs> best management practices that are, in our view, oversized for their intended purpose. Um, this is further exemplified by section 307B10 of the site plan regulation uh, that requires 12 inches of freeboard for a detention basin during a 50-year storm event. Now, the storm detention basins of old, which just held water and had a liner or otherwise, a lot of, a lot of reason for that. Um, there's been a great maturation of our stormwater design, specifically just even in the last 10 years, as to the way in which alteration of terrain reviews these items and the way different municipalities are also addressing them. Um, in our view, this regulation is antiquated in comparison to the current requirements due to the maturation, again, of those stormwater best management practices, which include both infiltration and filtration practices um, that require the embankment or the elevation of that berm not to be exceeded during a 50-year storm event, i.e., not a foot of freeboard, but just making sure it doesn't <coughs> overtop. Um, we would request that this modification be a discussion with the board to confirm the standards proposed do not have an impact on the public health and safety as specified in the ordinance. Um, and it's important to hearken back to that because within the PUD there is a statement that certain items cannot be waived if they are of negative consequence to the public health and safety. Requiring a foot of freeboard in a 50-year storm, um, I won't say it's arbitrary, I'm sure it was purposeful when it was intended, but it's, it doesn't meet the current rules and regulations. So there are a total of uh, one, two, three, four items within the stormwater regulation. So the four or five pages you have, there's four specific items that we're asking for a departure from. Um, 3.07A1, which is general, the manner in which this currently reads. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the current and what we're asking to modify. Uh, the drainage system shall be designed so that the post-development runoff rate does not exceed the pre-development runoff rate. Detention retention areas may be used to achieve this requirement. Underground detention structures may be permitted where they are determined by the town to be a reasonable application without detriment to adjacent properties and environmental systems or contrary to public interest. Underground detention structures shall be designed, constructed, and maintained in accordance with the New Hampshire Stormwater Manual, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, dated December 28, or latest uh, revision. 
our modification would read as follows. The drainage system shall be designed so the post-development runoff rate does not exceed pre-development runoff rate. No change. Stormwater management areas may be used to achieve this requirement. So we're removing the terminology that's somewhat dated as far as detention, retention basins. We have so many more tools in the engineer's tool belt, tool belt now as far as designing these. Um, so these areas may be used to achieve this requirement, period. Underground detention structure areas are permitted. And all stormwater management areas shall be designed, constructed, and maintained in accordance with the New Hampshire Stormwater Manual, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, dated September or dated December 28, uh, 2008, or latest revision, i.e., NHDS chapter EMVWQ 1500 AOT. So in our minds, what we're doing is we're, we're taking out some dated language, saying all of these best management practices have been approved by the state. If they've been approved by the state. That means they aren't of negative consequence to public health or safety. And we would like to be able to use that element. Um, there have been some historical we'll call them recommendations where we consider bottoms of basins impervious. It's not written into the regulations, but it's historically been a recommendation. By removing some of this narrative at the town's discretion, which does give uh, the town the opportunity to, to limit us in those capacities, we're looking to go to the current standard um, and standards that are tried and true and are appropriate for a project of this magnitude. Um, the second item is in regards to 307B10 design computations. Um, as currently written, uh, this reads, Flood routing calculations shall be provided for the design of each detention basin and pond using acceptable methods such as modified pulse, uh, storage indication, or as may be approved by the town engineer. In addition to the design storm, a 50-year storm analysis shall be conducted to establish the 50-year elevation at the detention basin. A minimum of 12 inches of freeboard shall be provided above the 50-year storm to the minimum elevation of the embankment at the detention basin. I'm just going to skip to that last sentence. That's what we want to revise. Um, all the other elements would hold true, but a minimum freeboard in accordance with NHDS Chapter ENV WQ 1500 alteration of terrain shall be provided above the 50-year storm to the minimum elevation of the embankment of the stormwater management practice. So we're just getting current to those regulations. Um, we don't feel that that foot of freeboard is warranted and that although we will strive for that as part of our stormwater management, which is something that I've reviewed with John, to be beholden to that arbitrary one foot, um, it's really just not in the best interest of the development. So we're asking for a modification there. 3.07 G1, pipe size, velocity, and type. Your current standard requires a 15 inch pipe, no matter what, no matter what the flow. We're asking to modify that to allow the minimum pipe size to be 12 inches. Um, there are other regulations that are within that subsection that talk about uh, maximum vin minimum velocities, cleansing velocities. When you have a larger pipe, it's harder to get those cleansing velocities. Um, so when we have, small, we have small contributing areas, a lot of times we end up asking for a waiver because we can't attain that cleansing velocity because it's just because the pipe's too big for what drains in it. So that would be the nature of one request. And the last item, which is 307H, relative to drainage structures, uh, currently reads, um, manholes and other drainage structures shall be precast concrete, meeting H20 loading, and constructed and installed in accordance with New Hampshire Department of Transportation standards and specifications for road and bridge construction. All good. Uh, drainage structures shall not exceed 18 inch, or excuse me, 18 feet in depth, rim to bottom of structure. An important standard as well. Make sure it's constructible and can be accessed. All catch basins shall be outfitted with a polyethylene liner downspout. Okay, it also has value. Uh, outlet structures at detention basins, when necessary, shall be the typical town of Londonderry standard structure, a vertical slotted weir with overtopping grate and properly sized outlet pipe. Therein lies the item that we're looking to revise, uh, such that it would read, outlet structures at stormwater management areas, when necessary, shall be typical to that allowed by NHDS ENVWQ 1500 alteration of terrain. Now, having had the luxury of designing the vast majority of the drainage systems that are associated with this project, we currently have, to my knowledge, the town of Londonderry outlet structure at each one of our basins. We have one particular area, which is rather difficult, in trying to mid, uh, provide the appropriate attenuation of storms. It really takes a lot of tools out of the tool belt that we have to use this one structure. Um, we're asking to have the opportunity to use other structures. Now, what could those be? That could be as simple as a catch basin or manhole type structure of an appropriate size. They would have a trash rack on it and an inlet orifice that would then meter those flows. 
it just wouldn't necessarily be precisely slotted. Um, we found that those slotted orifices, when smaller, clog much easier and lose their effectiveness over time. Although noted, if maintained appropriately, the effectiveness would be okay. Um, we're just really asking for the opportunity to use some other tools here relative to that request. And those are the four items in regards to stormwater management. Um, of those four items, I don't think any of those are detrimental to life or limb when we talk about public safety or health, and as such, could potentially be waived by the planning board. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to specifically review these with John yet. Um, he, he just got this um, today. So I'd like the opportunity to review that further with him. But I would be appreciative of the board's thoughts when it comes to those specific four items and whether or not they're appropriate. <clears throat> so back up a little bit, just, just to understand, you're saying that you would like to meet the NHAOT permit regulations outlined in ENV WQ 1500. Those are state regulations that may differ from the town of Londonderry's regulations. That is correct. Nonetheless, you are still meeting all the state requirements that you will have to be going through yep. for this project here regardless. Yes, sir. So, so some of them would be like the outlet structure. A couple of things. So first of all, and, I, and the zoning for a PUD, 5.2 does not allow the board to waiver, to waive any of our drainage regulations our stormwater regulations. So there's going to be some further discussion with mm -hmm. Nick and I. Mm -hmm. That way I can understand particularly where he's talking about. Second, don't forget, this is the top of a hill. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a huge pond at the top of a hill. So you want to have all the belts and suspenders, in my opinion. And then granted, I'm a conservative <coughs> engineer. The one foot of freeboard, and then the, the discussion that Nick has about their typical outlet structure, I've got no clue what that <coughs> I don't think DES has a typical outlet structure. The town has a typical outlet structure because it works. I've been here for 22 years, and each pond that's been designed, I can go to that pond, and it, it's working. You know, it can be maintained. So that is the other issue that's, you know, we've got to be careful on. So as Nick indicated, you know, I need to converse a little further what he's actually asking <clears throat> for and... You know, and again, maybe there, maybe there would be some waivers. I just, you got to be very careful, just carte blanche, you know, granting all these waivers. Mm -hmm. And again, I just repeat, <laughs> it's not permitted by our zoning, and it's at the top of a hill, so you better be careful. Infiltration, where they're going to be blasting into ledge, that's another thing. How do you infiltrate into ledge? That's, uh, so I'll, I'll stop now. Do you feel as though it so, so do you feel as though that the state's <clears throat> requirements if I'm understanding that you're you're concerned that the state's requirements are not enough? I yeah. Absolutely. It, don't forget again For they, they'll degree. approve it and they're supposed to be doing the maintenance to it. We're an MS four community and you'll be right. seeing this shortly me coming forward with some other ordinances regarding maintenance of, of these facilities. If it's not maintained, there's going to be a problem. So. Anything from the board? <clears throat> so I, I need to get John's input before yeah. I can make yes. any uh, comment whatsoever. Yep. Yeah, I agree, I agree. with uh, Lynn. So yep. I, agree. I, I agree, but I, I do have a question. So. Let's say we allow them to use what they want to use, and a year down the road, we have a five-year flood, because <laughs> we don't have 100-year floods anymore. We have, we have one every year or every five years, <laughs> and, and what they put in fails. <laughs> so they own it. They've got to make the repairs and fix it and whatever they got to do, because these are not going to be public roads that they're going under, right? They're private roads? That's correct. correct. But again, but the storm water would again the storm water will be private too. Yeah. So I guess, okay, Mr. D, go fight with with Insight Technologies, you know, technology on the hill. Yeah, but the but the but the <coughs> the the uh, train wreck is going to be on their property. If the water can't get through, the train wreck's on their property. What comes down onto town land, onto the racetrack that's across the street or whatever? It'll be on the abutters land. Got it. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Between good. between their development and Grenier Field Road, there's quite a bit of development in there. Got it. Thank you. That's Anything else from the board? I agree. All right, on to the next one. Um, item four, section 3.09, vehicle circulation, parking, and loading standards. Again, this is a little bit of a reiteration in that, again, we're asking to use the IT um, parking generation manual for the calculation of our parking. Um, it just happens to show up in multiple places in either your ordinance, site plan regulations, or subdivision regulations. So I feel we've addressed that one, so unless there's further dialogue. Yeah. No, okay. you can keep going. Okay. Um, in regards to landscape and design standards, essentially we are asking to waive only where there are items that are in conflict with what we have proposed. Um, the modifications that we are asking for are really specific, specific to Section 310G, which is mitigating the impact of parking lots. Um, the idea is we're not trying to have massive screening elements between what is a circular loop roads that are associated with our um, housing element. We do have trees. They'd be planted every 50 feet. Um, they're planted in appropriate areas such they'll survive. Um, we're not looking to screen street parking from adjacent uses. And similarly, the manner in which we've laid out the facility somewhat precludes that need. Um, we do have that central arterial that runs through the middle of the property. That's also an elevated roadway. Um, such that you have a natural bifurcation of the property between the residential and industrial uses. Um, adding an excessive amount of vegetation in our minds is inappropriate, so we have some minor modifications. So I'll provide some additional detail to staff for their review in regards to that item. But when it, it is not a uh, universal request, it's specific just to item 310G, um, and that's in regards to mitigating the impacts of parking lots. If no specific comments, I'll move to the next section, which is Section 312, Building and General Appearance Design Bear Standards. Bear with me for one second. Yes, sir. Okay. Board, have anything on that before we keep going? Mm. No? All right, go ahead. All right. So this is actually very similar to the signage standard, um, where the intent of the modification here is to remove future ambiguity that the Building General Appearance Design Standards are met and the additional information provided in Section 29B18, which is our PUD, is to provide clarif clarification as to how they are met. All projects would be reviewed by the Heritage Commission as is typical practice. So again, this is just providing additional details on our architect's design and intent practices to show how they are consistent with your architectural design guidelines, again, to remove future ambiguity as part of those review processes. Everybody else set with that? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, number seven, section 601C, on-site improvements. You may eliminate this one. Um, actually, no, I apologize. This one is, 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 is a continuation. Um, so in order to protect wearing course pavement during construction of other PUD components, we are requesting a modification to allow a certificate of occupancy to be issued by the building department after on-site improvements specified on the applied site plan are completed and inspected in accordance with section 6.02 up to binder course pavement. That's the kicker. Um, right now it reads wearing course. The reality is we're going to have multiple buildings going up in sequence to put in our final pavement as the infrastructure of that in order to allow a CO. Um, we'd be damaging that pavement and shortening its lifespan, which wouldn't be the objective. So we're merely asking to swap out that terminology from um, wearing course to binder course. And I think we could come up with an understanding of at what point does yeah, that then need to be applied? Yep. Down. I'd like to work with that on you on how we determine that. Yeah. Yes, sir. And as well as well on the binder on the binder course, making sure that you have shoulders raising up to any raised structures or anything like yep. that on the all on appropriate the road. transitions to facilitate access, drainage, you name it. Flat tires and everything. Yes, else. sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Everybody understands that? You should be good. All right. Um, the yeah. next one is actually very similar. Um, similar to the prior request to protect wearing course pavement, we request a modification of the definition stated in this section for substantial completion of improvements as shown on the site plan. Um, as currently written, it reads, completion of all infrastructure and drainage <coughs> improvements to support the development, including the roadway wearing course in accordance with the approved plans. Um, the modification would be completion of all infrastructure and drainage improvements to support the development, including the roadway binder course in accordance with the approved plans. So just, uh, again, that one, one change, uh, very similar to the item above. All right, we're, we're getting there, folks. All right, next item is the Londonary subdivision regulations. 
We may cross out item one. You have a number nine land oh. use fees, site plan fee. You know what? I jumped right over that because yep. staff recommended it. Um, we're essentially looking at this kind of like an alteration or train permit. Charges per square foot we're impacting, so that way we're not double counting areas yep. and looking at this and say, okay, it's 110 acres. Every time you come back, you're paying for 110 acres. This allows the applicant to pay for the areas in which they'd be impacting as part of each site plan application. Thank you. This is how we handle each yeah. Woodmont site plan. Yep. It's just in the Woodmont example, they typically have the waiver every time they come yep. forward. Yep. No, I'm good with that. I thought ahead on this one. All right. Um, jumping ahead. Apologies for that. Not a um, problem. Londonderry subdivision regulations. Items one and two may be struck. Again, that's we don't need to ask a waiver to have a waiver. Um, and then we just have items three and four. Uh, item three is a regurgitation of the stormwater drain requirements. So that would be handled as, as part of the review um, with engineering and environmental services. Uh, the next item is in regards to high intensity soil study. Again, this is really an antiquated reference. Um, it's very infrequently that these are done. Um, we do site-specific soils mapping now, and that's what's been provided for the project site. So we, we would ask to, to have that waived. <coughs> Any questions on that? Nope. Right. Thank you. All right, um, jumping ahead, there are, in addition to the requested waivers and modifications um, submitted by the applicant, staff recommends the board consider the following. Um, this one's a little long-winded, but it'll, it'll make sense in the end, I think. Uh, the calculation presented in the PUD for the allowable number of residential units uses the entire property development area of 110 acres. The residential village area, too, is known to only be 38 acres. The calculation number of units for the development based on only 38 acres of residential area will result in not more than 228 units at six units per acre. Um, and staff provides a recommendation. We, we've since done a little bit of additional research that we had originally evaluated, uh, and I'm gonna read just a couple of sections that pull right from your ordinance and I think provide the clarification necessary that the 110 acres is the appropriate mechanism for determining density. Um, what are you proposing for a number of units? Um, our total number of units is 439. Um, by the six, uh, by, what is it? Per six acres, if we just took it as a microcosm of the 110, we'd be allowed 660. Um, when you break it down in the land use components that the town otherwise provides, I think it's 474 would be allowable. So we'd still be under those, both of those thresholds. Um, so reading from the ordinance, section 527C, standards of development of the ordinance states, in PUDs where residential uses are proposed, the overall residential density of a PUD may not exceed six residential dwelling units, including single family homes, per gross acre of the PUD tract. That's the important part, PUD tract. Um, it goes on to read, in determining appropriate density, in addition to other criteria here, the planning board shall pay special attention to the amount of available land contained on the tract as determined on reasonable um, estimate in the submission materials. Permitted non-residential uses may be located in a flexible spatial environment, assuring compatibility with residential uses and the overall uh, development design, period. You know, in the case of the proposed PUD, the mixed-use village is comprised of a singular tract. We have one parcel, 110 acres, there's no subdivision that's being proposed. Um, as documented in several locations of the ordinance, the term tract does not imply land use areas or types, as this is otherwise defined within the ordinance, i.e. tract does not correlate to the area associated with the land use type in calculating the allowable density. We we'll also draw your attention to section 525B, basic requirements which defines track size as the minimum area required for a PUD shall be 100 continuous acres. That in and alone says, what is a tract? It is your PUD, therefore it must be 100 acres. Um, we would therefore be allowed to account for our density based off of the total 100 acres of our <coughs> PUD track based off of the definitions of the ordinance. So we'll provide that. I, I had an opportunity to talk to Kelly about it briefly today. I think we're on the same page. Um, but by this definition, tract is the entirety of the PUD, and a density would be calculated accordingly uh, as demonstrated by the calculations in the ordinance and also uh, replicated in our PUD application. So I, I think we're in a good, good spot for this. It's no, no different than we would see any other mixed-use development. As long as it's a singular tract, they have the opportunity to count for their density over the entirety of that land area. I get the tract piece, Nick, but, but what about usable land? The wetlands does it yep. again and all i'm going to yep. have to so a few months yep further further in the documentation of our application we do that full calculation which would allow up to 474 units when you exclude easements steep slopes right. wetlands and we still fall below that threshold 
Yep. Okay. So that so that would be that four thirty nine is is below the threshold that that the you're The usable land calculation. Uh, using the usable, usable land calculation. Land. <clears throat> okay. That way we're we're covered in both instances. Okay. So that's why again the calculation will be beneficial to just see how we came up with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, comments, questions in regards to that? I think providing the, the calculation makes makes sense. Does yep. the board have any anything else you <clears throat> want to add to that? No, it's the calculation. Is good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, if you turn to pages 39, 40, 41, and 42 of the yep. EUD document, there's some calculations in there that'll little back up what we've had to say thus far. Um, item two, the PUD notes the building height for a residential housing unit exceeds the 50 foot maximum allowed. Proposed height is 60 feet. Um, staff was recommending we further evaluate this. So we really hearken back to the response that we had in regards to London Dairy Zoning item comment number seven, where we clarify what we mean by building height. Um, if we're comfortable with what we're calling building height, then there is no concern with item two. It essentially goes away. The only thing though is you need to make sure it, the, your building height is in conformance with the IBC, International Building Code. We're not Fair. arbitrarily calling your I, building I height. sure hope our architects saw that far ahead. <laughs> I see some nodding heads. Yeah, I'm, I think we're, but duly noted. Yes, sir. Architects, engineers, hey. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> as far as engineers I'm getting along with that. architects, this I'm has been great. It's like oil and water, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, I find a good one. Um, <laughs> the next item, the PUD did not include information to demonstrate the project would meet the performance standards noted in LZ0516. Um, and staff had re recommended to have a discussion here. Um, we, we felt the PUD was submitted in strict compliance with Section 5.2, uh, Plan Unit Development of the Zoning Ordinance. Um, LZ0516 is not a part of that, but we're happy to provide answers to all of those questions. Um, this is a little long-winded, so I'll try and be quick with my tone. Uh, our temperament here, uh, 5161 relative to vibration. Uh, the industrial building will not produce vibration that will be transmitted through the ground and is discernible without the aid of instruments at any point beyond the lot line. The industrial buildings are involved in producing optical and electrical devices. Such manufacturing requires low noise and low vibration environment to facilitate precise optical alignments um, and delicate optical and electric assembly. We noted that the work is similar to that being done by Insight Technology, which is now L3 Harris on adjacent properties. Um, 5.16.2, which is in regards to noise. The industrial and commercial facilities will not produce any noise greater than the 75 decibels at the property lines. All employees driving vehicles onto the property and all trucks servicing the property will be required to have suitable mufflers so as to not to be objectionable due to the intermittent beat frequencies or shrillness. There is no rail service to the property. Air pollution. Um, I think this is, this is an important element, too, because we do have a farm in close proximity, and we want to make sure that we're upholding all of their elements of their, their facility. Um, visible emissions. There will, be, uh, there will not be any visible discharges into the atmosphere from any source of air pollution, period. The industrial facilities are engaged in development, produ production, and support of electrical and optical systems. Such activities do not involve any process that generate visible discharge. Uh, Sub-item B, smoke and air contaminants. The industrial facilities will be engaged in the development, production, and support of optical and electrical equipment. Such operations are non-polluting. Like Insight Technology, now L3 Harris, the industrial facilities will be occupied by Envision Technology um, and on-point systems. It will not be polluting. Um, there are sub-items 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, it's not anticipated that smoke will be discharged from any of the industrial facilities. In the event any smoke is discharged, it would be limited to a maximum of two Wrangleman for periods totaling four minutes in <coughs> and 30, second, or 30 minutes period. Uh, no Wrangleman of period totaling three <coughs> in any 15 minutes when starting a new fire. Um, there's some more analytical information there that I'll admit is above me, but we'll be happy to review that with staff to make sure that's consistent with all expectations. Um, the industrial and commercial facilities shall not emit any dust, dirt, or fly ash. There will not be any emission of, of an air contaminant from a manufacturing process or its equipment when the emanated uh, contaminant as measured in the flue contains sulfur dioxide more than 2,000 parts per million. There will be no construction, reconstruction, installation, or subsequent alteration of incinerators. And then five, material handling. No person will cause or commit any materials to be handled, transported, or stored in a manner which allows or may allow particulate matter become airborne. 
The residential buildings will be all electric with the electricity provided by solar panels on the roofs and local utility company. The industrial buildings are all used for clean manufacturing, uh, customer product testing and customer service. Uh, again, like the Insight Technology, now L3 Harris building on the adjacent property. No smoke or other emissions will be discharged from these buildings. <coughs> Waste from the buildings consists largely of paper, non-recyclable packaging material, and refuse form, uh, from employee lunch and breaks that goes into a dumpster. Uh, the dumpsters are removed by a waste company, so similar to any other business use we would have. Um, we'll have the opportunity to review these with staff, but wanted to make sure that uh, it was at least acknowledged that uh, we had thought ahead and made sure we looked at those items in addition. There are some comments now on PUD approach for consideration. Chair, so this, this really gets into other comments at this yeah, point, right? Yeah, I was right? just going to suggest like, um, the the comments that Nick is referring to uh, were third party related comments. Yeah. Those may change based on the board's feedback yep. and the initial it, additional it information point. provided by the applicant. Yep. So now may be a good time for the board to move to the public should, sure. you, should you choose. Absolutely. Right, can I go back to one? Yep. So under Lunaday site plan regulations, number 4309. Vehicle circulation, parking, and loading standards. Yes, sir. So we have had issues um, in the past concerning, and, and you all are going to have some tall buildings with our fire department circulation of their extremely, in fact, coming into this facility, you're going to get our largest fire yep. vehicle, <coughs> the longest, the widest. And Mr. Chair, could you help me with the with the with the website? Uh, yeah, if fire you, truck thing, whatever it is. If you go on to uh, the fire department's website, they have a in their drop down menu. They, I'm sure you're well aware of it. They have they have what their truck is, so you can do your study based yep. off. Of so that. we've already conducted the turning radius studies required for that vehicle to show that um, the roads work for that purpose. Thank you. Um, in this case, our outer roads are wider than our inner roads. And in office, also, that's also a, a traffic calming mechanism, so we don't have people whipping around. So no. 28 on the out, outer rim roads to provide that necessary circulation, and then 24 along the interiors. And then again, also showing that the, the fire truck has the ability to make all those necessary turning movements. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Yes, Thank sir. you. <clears throat> So I want to uh, go to staff. I know we've talked back and forth, see if they have anything they'd like to add. We'll come to the board and then we'll open it up to the public. John? Yeah, I think uh, I'd like to ha have a better opportunity to, to look at Nick's revisions, yep. allow him some opportunity to, to put some tables together so that the, the board can understand what he's asking for. I get it, but I get a little clearer now than I did last week. Sure. To be dead honest with you all. So. Sure. That's all I have for now. Great, there. Thank you, Kelly. I would agree. I think we're in a better position to review this and provide formal recommendations at the next meeting. Sure. Fantastic. And I'll go through the board. I'll start with Sean. You have anything? No. Roger. I'm happy. Uh, only question I have is you mentioned that there's going to be sidewalks. <clears throat> is there? And I noticed in your PD uh, document. You mentioned access to the rail trail as a positive. Are you going, do you plan on having a sidewalk all the way down Kitty Hawk Road? Or? No, so the, in, the intent there was to identify it as an amenity. Similar to the other business uses that are in proximity, you have the ability to walk, to ride your bike, to otherwise get to that rail trail. Um, it is very close for us, so we thought it would be appropriate to point out that our residents will have easy, ease of access to that, either walking or riding a bike, but there's no formal offsite Just based off their proximity to yes, the rail trail itself. Yep. Good, Jason. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, no, I, I'm also Mr. Chair. Mr. Rugg? Okay, I get several things. Uh, let's see. Section 2.3.A, um, Involvement of Relevant uh, Town Departments and Boards. The uh, last sentence reads, a conceptual discussion was also held with a chairperson of the planning board that led to further enhancements to this PUD document. Uh, there was not a discussion with the chair. It was the full board. And that meeting was on the uh, 12th of April, 2023. So it was about a year ago. We've been working hard for some time on so, this. So we may make the correction on that. 
So you're just just looking for clarification in that that it was with the board, not the chair. Correct. And let's see, two traffic mitigation uh, <coughs> questions. There's a traffic uh, import uh, impact and access study that's mentioned in 2.8.B.10, and also in section 2.9.B.9, uh, summary of proposal traffic impact, a traffic impact study. Are those the same study or are they two different studies? Singular study. There was one, one study. traffic impact and access study okay. performed for this project. And when is that going to be available? Oh. It is currently submitted on pending review. Correct. It's under review. And it's, as I mentioned, we need to have an understanding of what the master plan regulatory document is going to consist of so that we can <coughs> review the traffic accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. And you need a full understanding of what. Back, back to number, right, number of units of housing. If right. we say yes to the 439, or are we saying, you know, we're going to, that, that's going to drastically change what the traffic study would be. So I think yeah. we're, we're, we're going to be looking at the yeah. impacts, uh, Caraway, uh, uh, Harvey Road, um, <coughs> Kitty Hawk Landing, Grenier Field Road, uh, Grenier Field, Page Road, the intersection with Bamboth Road. There's a lot of traffic uh, complaints and accidents at that intersection and also the traffic light at Rockingham Road. So those are all going to be impacted. We need to have at least a, uh, a feel of what you're going to be generating for, for traffic. I know each site plan subdivision that you'll be submitting, those will go through the same process also. Mm -hmm. So the initial uh, site plan will have uh, basically the ground level. And then each additional plan from there adds to it. So the study will have to be done to see what the impacts are. So, so I'll offer for a clarification that we've done this a little bit different. Um, yeah. We've done a full traffic impact and study for the entire development because we know what our uses are. Okay. Now, may they modify? They may be modified a little bit here or there as we go through the site plan approval process. And if there's a significant deviation, we would update it. Um, but the intent was to provide the opportunity to know what those impacts would be, and then as we move towards the site plan approval process, to verify them. So what this does with the traffic study that's prepared is it provides the framework, much like the PUD provides the framework for all these other ordinances. It allows us and allows ideally the board and the community have a comfort level with what's being proposed, that there isn't some dramatic offsite improvement or otherwise that needs to be uh, constructed. Gives the staff the opportunity to review and verify that. Now, the traffic study may not be fully approved, but it would allow the board the opportunity to approve the PUD, knowing that that traffic study is then going to be reviewed subsequently at each site plan amendment. Okay. That's so, what we need to know. It's just, yep. you know, like a general uh, <clears throat> overview of what's going to happen at the beginning and then each plan will, you know, will have the details so, to it. So similar to another PUD that is very local, yes. that's what they had done initially was an overall traffic they, analysis. They, traffic they, they did a huge traffic analysis because it involved so then, a, a bigger lot, area. A lot bigger project, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. So and I'm sure you read the, read the uh, traffic section. On I the, enjoyed <laughs> that bedtime reading thoroughly. Uh, it's, it's a long document. Rug. So again, yeah, so in that big overall traffic study as each of those components came in what was the impact so as nick has indicated and that's that's e that's the best way to to look at traffic you have to look at it as a as a whole not just each piece because as nick says when we first sat down what's going to come first we don't we don't really know you know as time progresses here we're going to have a better understanding they'll be able to take pieces out of the traffic report and re plug and chug the numbers yeah, it's like putting the building blocks in place correct that's so maybe initially there is not an impact to, to one one or two of these intersections but as and it also allows them to plan accordingly too so that they can plan for their offsite improvements okay so that's uh, how it's that's next where question we're at with is what, what role do you see public transit uh, playing with uh, your, your your project your pod I think that's one of the items that needs a little bit more consideration. Um, yes. The intent is to provide uh, an enclosure for a school bus pick up and drop off at the end of Kiraway um, as part of the, the future development <coughs> of this site. But whether or not it would be a formal um, bus stop, I, I guess we haven't gotten that far. And it's something we can talk about. You might want to just reach out to MTA because they, yes. have, they did one dick on uh, Innovation Way. 
Okay. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you, you need to talk with them, uh, you know, see what their plans are also. And then the other thing is uh, a discussion with Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission. I think Kelly is going to be handling that with the, uh, uh, you know, impact determinations. But it, it's into what uh, Woodmont is. It's, a, it's an impact. Southern New Hampshire would want to have input on it. Not that we might agree with everything they say, but we need to review it, so. Yep. <laughs> then, <clears throat> nothing else, Mr. Chair. Mr. D? I'm all set, Mr. Chair, thank you. And? All set tonight. All set tonight. Fantastic. I will, uh, I'll open it up to the public. Does anybody have any comments, you, questions, concerns? Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave Robbins. Live at 532 Mammoth Road. Thank you. Um, between Grenier Field and Mammoth uh, in um, Rockingham, you know, the part of town called the village. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions, uh, some real concerns about, about this type of development. I think the live, work, play philosophy is, is good in concept. However, I'm not sure that we're there. Uh, I think Henry Ford changed all that a long time ago. And if you have any question about it, get on 93 at 630 in the morning. So uh, some of the, so th this 440 units is going to create a lot of traffic. And like I said, I live on the section of Mammoth Road where Grenier Field and Page all meet the intersection that we have all kinds of problems. And the town council had approved stop signs for us several months back. We haven't seen it yet. It's, you know, so we can't judge the impact of what those stop signs are going to be on our road. We had a lot of speeders, traffic problems, things like that. Um, so we're growing without really addressing the surrounding infrastructure issues. For instance, today, when I work, I've worked on Technology Drive for 20 years. I left Technology Drive, went to the airport. When I went, I went down Pettengill Road. It was backed all the way up from the light where New Balance is being built all the way back to Industrial Drive. So we keep, everyone's doing their traffic studies and it's almost like each traffic study is autonomous. And they're building and building and building and we're creating all these problems on roads that aren't really made for it. Um, so I caution just from an overall infrastructure within the town. Um, my other concern is going to be with Londonderry Fire. We have eight or nine buildings here, all 50 feet high, four stories. Is North Station adequately staffed to fight a residence fire in that area? The latter, I think, is coming out of Central, <clears throat> right? So if you got it, it's different to evacuate people from a fourth story than evacuate an industrial building, which is what we're doing now because there's nothing else up there like this, right? So we're dropping this PUD in the middle of a commercial industrial area adjacent to the airport. So it's gonna be an island up there, right? Um, you know, will fire need another um, ambulance in North? What's it gonna do to our battalion strength? We just got to battalion strength, right? I mean, we all know the, the finance problems we're having because we ran six short. Um, so these are all things I'm thinking of. We brought up North School. What's the impact on North School? You know, these, are, these, aren't, these aren't issues that we're going to correct in short order. You know, look what, you know, we just, what we did down at the school, we didn't approve all day kindergarten or building out, you know, the additional rooms to get rid of our modulus. So, you know, Londonderry is a great town and we need to grow, but I think we need to do smart growth. I, I, I'm concerned about where this particular type of development is placed. I think it has potential to fail, which would be really bad for us. Um, I'm gonna climb out a little bit on a limb here. I'm gonna, given the topography of this land and having walked the hill up to Insight, We've already said that, you know, that there's a big downslope, 120 feet over this 100 acres. Um, I'm going to say probably that land isn't conducive to much larger buildings. And if you look at the way everything's laid out, you know, I know we talked about density 
um, briefly in the calculation for density in a 100-foot track. And we said is, there's no subdivision in there. But there are two clear areas here. You've got a commercial area. You've got a residential area. And I think we're, we're making it dense because we're putting all the residences in the shoehorn because the land really doesn't work for spreading things out more. So it's almost like we're forcing it. So I would, I would, I would caution approval of this, of this plan in that area until other things are addressed. Because I don't, I'm not quite sure we're ready to throw, you know, a thousand residences up on that hill in the north end of town. But thank you. I appreciate your consideration. Your name was again, sir? Dave Robbins. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ray Breslin, 3 Gary Drive. Uh, the initial concept here uh, of what they're proposing is, is, is a great idea. However, the location uh, is of concern. This is on top of a hill, uh, and um, if anybody's been up there, um, there's a lot of rock that's been blasted out of there in the past. And I'm sure there's plenty of ledge up there now, uh, it, which is going <coughs> to require uh, further potential blasting. I don't know what's in the ground, but uh, it's a good chance. Uh, and we're talking about uh, stormwater runoff. We're talking about uh, access to emergency vehicles. We're talking about uh, traffic problems that we already have up there in that area. And... Um, and we're talking about uh, FedEx, um, <coughs> UPS, uh, all of those trucks are going to be uh, potentially driving up there on a daily basis to uh, supply not only the businesses, but also to supply the residents in those buildings. Everybody orders stuff online today. And uh, this is a concern. It's, and, and my concern uh, primarily uh, really is about stormwater runoff. Uh, we're talking about a hill, probably over 100 feet high, 100 acres, um, and um, the runoff uh, is, is going to eventually, there's a brook that runs down off the hill, by the way, and that runs into Coas Brook. Where does Coas Brook go? It goes to the Merrimack River. We've got a problem right now with water contamination. We got a situation uh, where we just pa passed a, uh, uh, <clears throat> we passed something for $100,000 to uh, make sure that we're in compliance with MS4. Mm -hmm. That's about stormwater runoff. Uh, and by the way, the EPA just uh, said they're dropping it to four parts per trillion for PFOA and PFAS. We have some serious concerns in this town that we have to address. And, and we're, we're looking at approving some of these things when we, we're behind and we, we gotta play catch up here. We gotta bring in municipal water, we gotta deal with, we gotta bring in sewer. Uh, we have a problem with traffic and, and we're, we're moving ahead on on some of these projects which basically are a great idea in the right place uh but we got to put a lot of thought in before we make final approval on some of these things i would suggest <clears throat> i think if anybody got any questions thank you right no questions okay mr chair a question for the developers so sure. <clears throat> so you will have uh Town water, city water from Merrimack or from Manchester Water Works, as well as town sewer up at that site. Yes, sir. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone else from the public? I got another question. <laughs> Come on back, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, no one else. Uh, there's one more right behind you, so make it quick. Oh, oh uh, uh, abutters are important too, by the way. <laughs> there's an abutter right behind you. Let I know. Who, I know. I know. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, no, my question is this, in, in regards to this housing, is this housing just going to be for the people uh, 
that are going to be working in these businesses or 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 in in what what is this housing is it high end housing is it low end housing um or is it it's just simply for the people that are working up in this village I believe you guys talked about this on at the conceptual meeting yes. um and that it is going to be it's all market rate housing. It's, it's all it, on the market, no? Correct. And it's primarily to service our employees, but we're making it available to the other employers that are in the general area. So so could anybody so apply to live there? Theoretically, Ray could go rent an apartment there. If I wanted to. Theoretically, yes, right. <laughs> the, I, I, theoretically, okay. It would have to have clean so that's, water. That's a pretty vague answer, but that's okay. That's sewer. okay. City water is it's a sewer. start. <laughs> if Ray's going to live there, it's got to be clean water. I couldn't afford to live there. <laughs> so is there any plan for preference to the people who work there, is or is it completely equal availability? Well, preference is pretty much prepared, Mr. Farber, by, the, by um, Insight Envision because... Primarily, we're going to be providing housing as part of our employment packages okay. in order to hire the people that we need. Mm -hmm. So the preference would naturally go to those employees first. Okay. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Bob. Hi. Bob Mel, 569 Mim Road. Um, my family abuts London Dairy Hordens. I personally don't, but other members of my family do. Um, I was looking at the town master plan the last one that was completed, and you read uh, page 39, and it basically says an industrial part is where people go. They go either, you know, to work, pick up, you know, product, deliver products, and they leave. And it's basically not a conducive place for people to live or otherwise uh, spend time there. This is page 39 on the bottom uh, left-hand side. And it describes various types of retail, I mean, various types of uh, development in town, in like page 38, you know, strip retail, mall, big box retail, and various such. And in that, there were very, uh, other than for, you know, unless you're working there or you're there for a, a specific usage, you know, specific uh, reason, it be a place you don't go. Um, and you got to look at the traffic because you're already getting into field roads, particularly down uh, with Litchfield and High Range and, um, oh, trying to think of the other road comes into into it and uh they are the page road perennial field mammoth and you got other places where the road is basically getting to the point of saturation uh particularly since the airport access road has been put in the in into place um and so um I really think that the height should be maintained at no higher than 35 feet, and that basically would probably would mean uh, instead of four story high, you could probably only go three story high on the apartment buildings. And I think the town really needs to maintain it for safety, particularly fire safety. If a particularly uh, going to be a wooden uh, wood structure buildings. You might consider if they're going to be uh, steel and concrete uh, frame type buildings. Uh, so it's just something that coming to my coming up to my head. Um, I was looking at the various maps and I'm finding that the letter lane is between Kitty Hawk and um, and the Kia Way. Um, this is a highlight. Um, yeah, what is that? Hilltop. Uh in there. Um it's there's a little lot right there. Um I got the number. Twenty nine dash twenty nine seven 
it had been listed as a, a town on uh, for a number of years in the town report, and I looked at it this year, and it was not listed as a town on lot. It's just a small lot. I think the town need to clarify does the town own it or does someone else own it. I believe that the town took it for non-payment of taxes many years ago, and that needs to be clarified because the uh, someone should not be claiming private property is actually uh, the town property. Um, what was that number again, Mr. Merrill? Oh, okay, 29-29-7. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's just a basically uh, a little wedge between one lane and Drenia Field Road, and it basically services one house and <coughs> ends at uh, Leonard Lane. And I noticed in the, uh, Leonard Lane had been uh, um, what yeah. been reclassified at what a road on a small part right there at the end, right there where the uh, where it starts here at Dr on Drenia Field Road. I think we need to cl clarify that. Um, I think Leonard Lane might be an access, an emergency access point into the residential development either it was gated by the fire department as a third potential access point uh, if it doesn't open up as a, you know, as a fill road. Uh, let's see, it must be other things on my mind, but I don't remember them right now. Write them all down for us. Yeah, okay. I made a list, uh, uh, some of the list, and I picked a piece of paper and the wrong piece of paper. Oh. As a, on 17-2, um, there's a stone cover up there, and I think that should be uh, the Heritage Commission should take a look at that as a potential uh, something that should be saved, you know, with, you know, problem, you know with a hand-built stone cover uh, up there. I have not seen it, but I've been told about it. So that's something else to take into consideration. But I think really we need to keep the height of those buildings down so we don't create problems. And uh, the I think the real concern is do we really want to have an industrial, I mean, do we really want to have a residential, a large residential area in the middle of a in the little park, just, you know, I essentially live in an industrial park right now as it is. I got Fortin, uh, in the Fortin industrial park across the street and it has a number of, you know, industrial type buildings, trucking terminals, bus depot, and very other businesses in there. In the, uh, you got workplace systems, you got the, um, a little, little kind of place where the old FedEx place it you know, used to be, you know, terminal on the other side of me. So just a question of noise, sight, smell, and into the con contaminations already in that area. You got the airport, you got other truck and terminals and set. Is, is this really the spot for an in commercial, I mean, for a residential area? Um, when you start blasting on that hill, it carries for quite a ways. I've been already black and done where the uh, school office is now and others on, uh, so, you know, on, um, on that area. Um, and you already, you have natural springs coming up through the ledge, and it has uh, trading wetlands up there. Now, when you start in black, and you may either create a gusher of water, or you could block them up, so it could change the flow of the water up there on the hill. So that's something to take into consideration. You just don't know when you start black and what you're going to do.
to unturn the flow of the water coming. Are you going to block up the natural seepage, or are you just going to open it up like crazy? All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your That's help. And uh, if anybody on the don't go away. Questions? Don't go away. Please. Okay. Sure. So, you you mentioned a, a thirty-five foot height. Yeah. On the buildings. Uh, well, on the, where did uh, that number come from? Uh, in the town regulations, it says no structure can be more than thirty-five feet in the residential. In the residential structure. Thank you. And Is that for get, a residential zone or yes. uh, multi-family too? Also. Because this is multifamily. Uh, I'd have to double check. Uh, okay. Most of that area is zoned in Dutch, although, but yeah. there is an area on the very east of the legendary holding land that is uh, zoned residential. Yeah, so when, when they do, if this gets approved, the PUD will be an overarching yeah. zone. So it will have its own rules yeah. and, 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 and regulations. Yeah. Um, depending on all of the, many of the things we talked about tonight and some things that we didn't talk about tonight might come to the light in the, in the next meeting that we have mm -hmm. on this because yeah. um, I'm going to guess that there's going to be not a lot of decisions made tonight. So, yeah. well, um, so I appreciate your comments yeah. um, and um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens next. But that gives you time to find that piece of paper you're missing with all your questions yeah, on it. Yeah, too, I think we got more of meeting. them, but there's still probably one or two. Yeah. And I'll probably think of some more as I come along. That's all right. We, uh, appreci we appreciate yeah. it. Yes. But personally, I would personally, um, my opinion on this, on the 100 acre PUD that should be repealed, but obviously the Woodmont and this project are already grandfathered in, but I'd recommend that the town re repeal the 100 acre. PUDs for the future, but that's another discussion for another night, I presume. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you very thank much. You very much. Thank, you. thank you. Thank yep. you. Just to clarify, it is for multifamily um, building height shall not exceed fifty feet. <clears throat> Excuse me. In so a multifamily. In multifamily. Yeah, so in higher, this, is, so this is multifamily. Fifty feet <clears throat> is more appropriate than thirty-five. Yes. As far as you could interpret it that way, yes. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question now? Sure. Um, thank you. On page um, 39 of your document, um, under 2.9.B.4, um, I remember reading this and now I found it again. So under Village Area 3, it mentions um, Additional complementary uses are identified for potential future use and may include a machine shop business, injection molding business, and an electric, electronic circuit board assembly business. Um, um, supporting uses may also consist of research and development laboratories and professional office space. What area of this project would um, a machine shop inje injection molding business and an electronic circuit board assembly business go because I'm worried about anything any toxic substances that might be used in in processes so there. it would be located in that northerly most structure the 20,000 square feet of manufacturing that we had previously discussed which is a little bit of an open-ended as to what will be used for so when we look at the graphic it's centrally located okay. in the uppermost portion but even regardless of those uses, um, the other elements that we've discussed tonight would still hold true, talking about vibrations, emissions, or otherwise. That's universal to all of our uses. Um, so understood that that element is in there. The idea was to provide just an elaboration on what some of those uses may be, but and also to provide the corollary to our other <coughs> uses that are already proposed, that these are essentially sister uses so that instead of someone having to drive to these multiple locations to try and uh, ascertain all these different elements and get them all in one spot. So mm -hmm. again, we're taking uh, trips off the road. So, so they would support what's being proposed el elsewhere? Correct, sir. I remember when I was younger, I worked at an injection molding factory at the airport, right by the old terminal. So uh, thanks to that. Thanks. Can, I'm going to let the, the, we'll let it, I didn't expect that to go so long. We'll let the public finish up and then we'll yep. come back to the board. Yep. 
Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Kevin Smith, 6 King Phillip Drive, and as Dick mentioned, I've been uh, working on this project as a consultant with them. Appreciate all the comments by the board members and the public as well this evening. Uh, just a couple of points I wanted to make that I thought were worth noting. Uh, I think a comment came up during the conceptual discussion last year about um, the synergy of potential airport noise and, and uh, residential units being in that area. Um, the airport director, Ted Kitchens, has endorsed this project, um, looks upon it very favorably for a number of reasons, and uh, provided a letter for such, which I believe we have in our package, um, which we can uh, give to the board to uh, to review. Um, the question about providing public transportation and speaking with the owner, uh, Ken and Grace Selinski, I know it's their intention to want to provide MTA service to that area, and so we'll get you uh, clarification on that and, and a definitive answer um, when we next meet. And then with regard to traffic mitigation, um, you know, I, I have to credit John and the staff because I know they've been working with uh, DOT and looking at this area, especially the Pettengo Road area in totality of a number of these projects that are all coming in in that area um, with the uh, plan to widen that roadway. And I know they've got a plan uh, with DOT that they've been working on, and I think um, sooner than later uh, that'll be presented to the board. But I thought that was worth noting because I, I know that staff doesn't look at each of these projects just in a vacuum, that they do look at them all together and say, we've got to figure out how we're going to mitigate the traffic with all of these different projects coming in. Um, and I think when you after the traffic analysis has been reviewed by staff and you all get a chance to look at it, I think you'll see too that a lot of this traffic from this is projected to go um, north on Harvey Road uh, to Manchester, South Willow Street, 293, and, and uh, back that way as well. Um, so again, coming attractions, uh, but I just wanted to uh, say thank you again, and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else from the public? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to them. You have three letters. Oh, yeah, that's right. I have You have two, two. and I have one. Okay, perfect. I have two letters I will read. Uh, do you want to give me that one? I'll read it. I'll read it for you. Perfect. You want to read these? <laughs> <laughs> um, first one's from Envision Technology. Uh, Dear Planning Board, Envision Technology LLC is a company which designs and man manufactures electro-optical systems for the U.S. government. This includes the development and production of systems for multiple agencies within the U.S. Department of Defense, which are rated and certified for national defense use under the provisions of the Defense Priorities and Allocations Systems, DPAS. DPAS is used by the government to prioritize national defense-related contracts and orders throughout the U.S. supply chain. Envision has ongoing contracts with the rating of both DOA-A7 and DO-C9, and anticipates future orders within the same rating in the future. Within the past four and a half years, Envision has grown from a single employee to having nearly 50 employees supporting these important projects. With our ongoing work and continued growth trajectory, it is important that Envision continues to possess facilities which are sufficient for the company to perform its work for these vitally important customers. Due to its continued growth, Envision will exceed its existing facility capacity within the next two years which will begin to limit its ability to develop and produce cru crucial systems and equipment for the government. Therefore, it is a matter of urgency that Envision moves into its new facility as soon as possible so that it can meet its important obligations as part of the defense industrial base. Accordingly, I support Envision's plan to expand its operation as part of the proposed village on Technology Hill in the town of Londonderry as expeditiously as possible. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Contact me. Sincerely, Mark Belandra. Now, I have another one here. Dear Planning Board, Envision Technology LLC is a company which designs and manufactures electrical optical systems for the U.S. government. This includes the development of systems for the U.S. Army, which are rated and certified for the national defense use under the provisions of the defense priorities and allo allocation systems. It is important that Envision processes possesses facilities and resources which are su sufficient to the company to perform its work. Accordingly, I support Envision's plan to expand its operations as part of the proposed village on Technology Hill in the town of Londonderry. Sincerely, John Nettleton, project leader of Lasers for 
Research and Technology Integration Dir Directorate, DevCom, C5. There's a lot of words after that that I'm not going to say. <laughs> you guys got the hand. Kelly. The one I have is from the Tebow Corporation, located at 603 Mammoth Road in Londonderry. Dear members, as in a butter to the Londonderry Holdings LLC plan unit development, we are writing to state that we strongly support this application and wish to have this letter of support added to the record for the, of the hearing. Innovative planning such as this project is vital to the economic success of the community. Again, we strongly encourage this application. Thank you. So at this time, I'll bring it back to the board. Does anybody have anything else they want to add? Lynn, I think you had something. Lynn. So I did have one question uh, in terms of this process. When does the fire department get involved in, in uh, looking at building height? Building height's been a topic of discussion. I think we won't do anything without their approval yeah. the, for building the, height. And same with road access and turning <laughs> radiuses and, and things like that. I suspect they'll do a thorough review. Correct. All the departments, including fire, are involved at this stage, um, but we will be continuing to work with with fire, for example, to get um, their specific comments to the building height and, and the other concerns raised by the board this evening. Okay. Good. Mr. D? I have a couple of things that Mr. Smith uh, touched on. Uh, the Pettengill Road widening um, has come up several times in the past six months or so. Is that something that's in the queue or out of the queue or almost being thought about, or do we know what's What's so so what, what we're doing, as Kevin indicated, Tony, is again, so the, the staff, we have been looking at everything that's developable out there. So right now, um, we've got quite a few job projects in the queue. We have the hospital, we have New Balance, we have Tesla, we have the high cube, excuse me, two high cube facilities. We have a warehouse at the end of Plainview. So those with those six... We've come up with a plan, and we're, we're meeting with DOT to, to I'm going to simplify it. We're going to open up the cabinets and, and turn the knobs to, right. to see what we can do with the, the, the timing of the lights. So our full build-out, though, is we're looking at, and unfortunately, again, uh, Technology Hill wasn't in the queue. We had to, we had to strike a line in the sand and say, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. So, again, in full build-out, Technology Hill will be in in the, this next phase of it. So with that next phase, we're looking at as far as what needs to be done for expansion of w the widening of Pettengill Road and how that all impacts everything. So if you, if you were gonna guess, would you say that's five years out, 25 years out, um, two years out? The way the development has been going, I think it's gonna be quicker. So next week? Uh, no, <laughs> week, <laughs> week after. Yes, thank you. No, no, I, I and I understand, and I and I so appreciate that the help on that timeline. Essentially, thank you. we've we've evalu we've been evaluating traffic, we've sure. we've been made aware of the significant development in this particular area, and we've yeah. essentially developed a phasing plan that is being prepared to be implemented at this point. Thank you. That needed to be asked and answered for the for the video. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about. Uh, density and whether industrial and residential should be combined. And my opinion may or may not be different if this was plopping into a neighborhood. But this is going into an island where a developer slash owner is built, basically building a compound. Right? In my day, we called it a commune, but that's a different topic. <laughs> so so the, the market will decide whether it's appropriate or not. The market will decide whether it's safe or not. The market will decide whether, whether it's the right location or not. And so... It, it, I mean, it's a nice talking point to say, oh my gosh, it's going to be dangerous and kids are going to be maimed and killed because it's a hill and they're going to be rolling down the hill trying to get to the bus stop. That, that's not us. That's not, that's not my opinion. That's not what we do. So I think that, I think that, that in a situation like this where it's their housing and their businesses, they will, the users will make the decision on whether it's appropriate or not. If it's unsafe, parents won't put their kids in there. Um, if, it's, if, if the hill is 
too high for people to walk to the store, they'll they'll go look at it and they'll say, yeah, this is not for me. So, so I don't think we're in in the business of making that decision for them. That's a philosophical decision that I have have come to um, at this um, stage of the game, and. Um, We'll, we'll see if my mind changes before we, we get to a point where we're going to take any votes. Thank you. I just want to say, well, this project isn't an island because it is surrounded by some residential folks um, on the east side and towards the southeast. And I just want to make them aware of um, the type of business that's over there. It's, <clears throat> it's an agricultural business. That's why I may be concerned about anything floating over or whatever. Um, and they have uh, close tolerances with the government and uh, what they require. Um, or, so even surround businesses surrounding them. So I just want to make you aware <coughs> of that. It's a, it, it's been a, a farm. The the, the farmhouse was originally built in 1798, I think it was. So t we talk about history. Um, the Merrill Farm is one of the five starting farms in London Dairy, original farms. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, I consider this a, a, a good project for that area, but I just want you to be aware there to the um, east of you and the prevailing winds there are usually from the <coughs> west. So that's why I'm concerned. Um, about any type of issues with industrial plants. I know you'll take care of it, um, but I just want you to be aware that they're very sensitive. And the Merrills have conservation land. Um, the uh, town has an easement on the Merrills, the large farm, and um, Bob's brother, just, uh, Kenny Merrill, just uh, obtained a, uh, the town just obtained a conservation easement on his land which is to the east, of, immediately to the east of this project. And that area, I guess, is called uh, Merrill's Hill. So uh, I just want you to be aware that why some of us are concerned about <coughs> this project, not that it will stop it or anything like that. We just want you to be aware of the neighbors and be good, good neighbors to these people. Thank you. Uh, we've closed public comment at this time. Anybody else? I got uh, just my usual spiel yeah. is uh, work with your butters. Uh, they're what, you know, you've, you've heard some from here. Uh, I think there's uh, at least meeting with them, trying to address what concerns can, can be done. It, it makes the problems easier at public hearing time and everything for both you and for, uh, for us. I'm not trying to look to get out of it or anything, but it's <coughs> advice we always give developers is to please work with your players. They're the ones that uh, can make or break the whole thing. Anybody else? Yeah, the road at the airport. Didn't we make that wide that enough for to have two more lanes. I believe the town holds an easement through. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. I think there's supplementary designs. Uh, I think when Giannis was still here. So. so I think before we move on here, um, I do want to say a couple things. I think this is a very interesting development. Um, I, I do think it's in a decent location, but I think there are a lot of concerns. Um, we've heard some of that from Mr. Robbins tonight and a couple other uh, residents of the, of, of the town of Londonderry here. Um, so I, I think we have a little bit more digging to do before we make a decision on this project. Um, <clears throat> and I, I also feel that a, a project this size warrants its own uh, meeting, if you will. You know, something that doesn't have more agenda items that are taking a little bit of our our attention away from it, and I think it deserves its own meeting. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of information from you tonight. I feel as though you you two have a lot that you still still want to review, um, and you know we've heard it time and time again. We do get concerned about um, what our, what is going to happen to our services that we have from the town of Londonderry now. Um, so I think hearing a little bit of that input um, 
and, and how the fire department feels about stuff if if they have the appropriate apparatus up at, up at um, Station 1 um, it is a very important part of this conversation um, and what their concern is to adding, potentially adding another 430 units to the north end of town. Um, again, I, I think this is a, a pretty interesting project. Um, I, I find the location itself interesting as we've talked a little bit about Old Mammoth Road. You know, that was 200 years ago, however long ago that was made, that's exactly what they're doing today. You've had factories with housing getting built around it and that, that's what a lot of that old community was. And, you know, kind of still is to a degree. So I think it's a very interesting, um, this project is similar to a way to something that happened a few hundred years ago. They're, they're just looking to do it again. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I would look for a, um, I, I'd, I'd like, I'd, I'd look for a motion to continue this. I'd like to make it a special meeting. I don't know if we have any time this month, Kelly. Um, in terms of Wednesdays to to hear this again, or if you feel like you may need a little bit more time, I don't know what what the board has for availability, um, but I, I I would like to say I feel that this deserves its own meeting, and and we should certainly do that. I think knowing what time the staff needs to get things together exactly. is probably the first thing to uh, correct. To uh, no, but. Uh, our scheduled meetings are uh, the 1st of May and then the uh, 8th of May. Eighth of May. I don't know how much we, I think there's uh, Plainview, I think, is on for the 8th, uh, for the continuance, and then the 96-unit uh, multifamily on Gilchrist <laughs> is uh, on there. Our, May, the our scheduled May meetings are um, pretty full. I would assume, given, given the time of year, that we're... Yep. We're in our long meeting nights. Um, well, but I, I thought you were talking about a, a, yeah, a separate I would, meeting. I would, so. I would like a separate meeting that is its own agenda item. So yep. if we have something on, I think, well, the 24th or the 25th is two weeks from now. That give, should give you guys some, <clears throat> some time to look at stuff. This isn't my only project, Jake. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> you understand that. Yep, I get that. There you go. Thank you. Kelly? I can accommodate the 24th, but we need, sure. you know, I'll say I can accommodate the 24th, but I wouldn't uh, be able to speak on the other department's ability, for example, the fire department, to yep. give you what you're asking for at yep. that meeting. Okay. But if you wanted to hold a hearing and continue to work through some of these other items, absolutely, that's up to the board. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just kind of reading what Kelly and John just said and getting the, enough information, I, I think it makes sense to have that special meeting in May I'm at the earliest. As as I, I, I as don't think it's its own meeting. <clears throat> because if we're in a position on the, tw if we rush it to the April 25th and we're still in the then position of, yeah, like, yeah, do, yeah, we, do, we, we need some more information. Way. <clears throat> so, um, well, the problem is you push, well, you're pushing the applicant another month. Yeah, more than a month, because then that make, that puts it on the fifteenth. If you want to have a special meeting, because we're already full on the first and the eighth, you said. We're so, pretty full. I mean, we can. If you want to continue it to the, either of those meetings, we can do that. I'm just. We or, are, or another, we have another day of the week. I, I would do another day of the week. I, I don't want to push anything that's going to be so up can, at the I next meeting. I can tell meetings. you this. Yeah. If we're talking about May at this point, if you need time, I can. we also have to coordinate with the applicant. We can propose a couple of dates, and then I'll, we'll go through the entire legal noticing process again, including a butters. So in other How much words, time do you need for legal notices? 10 days, 15? It's 10 days is the requirement, Ten but um, I have enough time to get something out by towards the end of this month to no properly notice a May meeting. Okay. Can we so. ask the applicant right now? Sure. Do you, do you guys have a preference? Yep. Do you want to have another public hearing tomorrow? Or? <laughs> Actually, I like the idea of moving it into May as well. It gives us more time to work with Kelly and John. So does May 15th work for you? That's the Wednesday? There's a ZBA hearing. Okay. Never mind. Uh, Never mind. 
How about the, the, this room? We can get this off of the Wednesday. Bit. Yeah, what's an availability? So the, four, yeah. the 14th? Yeah. In May. Conscom? Is it here? I 13th is a town council like... meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seven. then how about the 7th? The 7th. Uh, Utilities honestly, committee. I'd have, you know what? <clears throat> Utilities committee what on the 7th. What day of the week, sir? Kick them out. Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> uh, what, them over there. What, what, what month we met several Fridays, so that's uh, Fridays not out of the question. <laughs> utilities. <clears throat> utilities committee meeting on Tuesday, <laughs> yeah. on the seventh. Thursday. The twenty second is the the Just next week day available with no meetings. No. Twenty second of of May. May. We want to do that. That's a Wednesday. That's a Wednesday. That's that's, that's pushing it. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, is there anything not on a Wednesday? <laughs> There's. We could have it on Saturday the eleventh. High school half a cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, that's an idea. Yep. Uh, there we go. So there we go. Now I've been trying to find a a, uh, <laughs> a calendar. I, I finally got one here. What's Monday the 29th look like? Of April. Uh, the 29th and the 30th are both open. Town hall closed all day. Is that a holiday? April 29th. And didn't Kelly just say she needs until April the end of the month? To yeah. Yeah, I to think. Yeah. Is that too soon? I think uh, I May is probably preferable, early May. May. Yes. We'll work with you. Yeah. So Monday, Kelly, May, did, Kelly didn't, didn't you just say? Month? You want May? Yeah. yeah. Kelly, didn't you just say you kind of need until the end of the month or to get the not, I don't think we should be looking at yeah. April. Real quick. We just focus on May. Real quick, Monday, May 6th, London Area Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting, which is in the Sunnycrest room. Yep. This is the Moose Hill room, right? Mm -hmm. So this room would be open. So could we do Monday the 6th? There's no town council meeting? Nope. 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 Nothing on the calendar. I won't have an engineer that day. No, we may not have all the comments back either. You can't do it, Nick. <laughs> I have another meeting that night already. I apologize. Oh, Monday the thirteenth is the recreation during commission. During the regular meeting, <clears throat> they meet across the hall. Uh, they, yeah, they're in another room. So, so Monday the thirteenth, there's no council meetings on here. When do the council meet? The council is the sixth and the twentieth in May. Okay, can we do the thirteenth? Thirteenth. They meet the across the hall. So thirteenth, thirteenth, thirteenth. I just want to be. I'm in North Carolina. John's not here. We don't need you anyway. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> I just want to be clear. We will still be noticing this. Yeah. So. Okay. So you yeah. don't have, you don't have to give your official notice. <laughs> All right. So then, do we want to leave it up in the air for now, and you'll let us know? I would recommend that, just so I have some time to. Okay. But I, just so you can put it as a placeholder. <clears throat> you got May 9. You got May I probably 16. won't be here on the 13th. Put a 10 to, to uh, the first May 9 weekend. and May 16th as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would be open to that. And we get the 8th as planning board and then do 9th planning board. Do the 9th. Yeah. So either way, we'll leave that up to you. You know, a couple dates that are in mind are the 9th and the 13th. The 8th um, and the 9th will be better for me. I'm out the 13th. We will send out a nice don't email, need me. making sure people are available. Made my comments oh, already. <coughs> Fantastic. Might have some more, Tony. <coughs> All right, Stan. So I, I'm looking for a motion. Do we need a motion, oh, please. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we recommend continuing this application until to be further noticed. Until TBD, you know, about middle of May, to allow the, the applicant and staff additional time to clarify the waiver and modification requests. You had a second. I have a second. Second from Jason. Jason, give it to Jason. <laughs> uh, Mr. Selinski, you're the applicant? Yes, sir. I, oh, yeah, I'll entertain it. Envision Technology and On Point Systems have both doubled in employment in the last year. We need to get into this space. And we need to do it quickly. We need to do it for On Point that's a consumer product. You could argue it's just employment in the state. Envision technology is doing stuff that's vital to the national defense. We need to get into space. We've got the people here. I'd ask that you pick a date while we're sitting here and everybody's here and can comment. 
rather than trying to do it by endless emails and text messages and phone calls. Just pick a date. Thursday the 9th. Yep. So can we amend your motion, sir? <clears throat> I'd like to amend my motion to can make John the meeting be there? on Thursday, May 9th. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. in the Moose Hill Conference Room. John? And Jason? You Jason will there? second it. I'll be here. I don't okay. know if I'll get through all the All in favor, stuff. say aye. 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 All, any opposed? Chair votes in the affirmative. Motion passes. All right. We will see you guys on May 9th. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, well, night at 7 p.m., yes. Um, you would ask about the square footage of wetlands. We yes. had a diligent employee watching it at home. Uh, 244,916 square feet. So that would Put be me in point, acres. Point that, so that in acres, that's 5.62. Um, so when we think about that as a decimal, that's 0 .004 or four-tenths of a percent of wetlands that would be impacted across 110 acres. Who'd have thought a big hill is dry? <laughs> Thank you. Right, have a good night. Please work Thank with the you. town staff to diligently get this information. Yeah. If, obviously, if you guys could work on it, we would appreciate it. Um, let me get the agenda up here. Give me a sec. Are we all done? Know we're we're rules, rules of procedure. procedure. Other business, Mr. Chair. Oh. Yep. Uh, so other business, we have our rules of procedure. Obviously, we met with our... Um, I'll give everybody a second to get out of here. Hurry up. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have our rules of procedure. We met with our attorney earlier. Um, we had a lot of d uh, discussion back and forth. I think the board has come to an agreement together that we're going to uh, have our attorney prepare a statement for our rules of procedure that will also be announced in the beginning of our meetings with regards to public comment and the best way to handle them. Um, we will wait until we get that back. I'm hoping the next meeting we can have our first reading of what the official rules of procedure will be. Uh, is there anything that anybody would like to add to what I've said? I think that uh, sums it right up, Mr. Chair. Fantastic. So we don't need a motion on that. So I will, uh, does anybody have anything else? Mm -hmm. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned.